At Wildlife Conservation Network, we believe there is hope for even the most threatened species. And we know it will take a community working together to make that hope a reality. That's why we invest in local leadership and conservation around the world, support a network of partners with bold, effective solutions, and establish wildlife funds to save a threatened species across its entire habitat. We connect donors with the conservation work they support and ensure 100% of their money goes to the work they care about. Together, we are building a world where people and wildlife can coexist and thrive. WCN is perhaps the most extraordinary and successful conservation organization anywhere. Join us in creating a future for wildlife. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to see everybody here. I want to start the day on a pretty interactive note, just by a show of hands. How many people here have seen a mountain lion in the wild? Wow, we've got a lot of lucky people. So I am not one of those lucky people. I've never seen a mountain lion. I'm going to talk to a few of you after this to fix this, especially Neil. Um, but a couple of weeks ago, I was, uh, I was hiking up in, in Marin County, and this bobcat popped out on the trail. And it was really, really a special moment. It was just walking down, and it kind of uh, stopped for a bit. It looked into the tall grass, and it, it pounced, probably hunting for some sort of rodent, and then it scampered off. My family and I were just in awe of this moment. There we were, two species, or probably many other species we were less focused on, but those two species, the bobcat and us, coexisting. And it was, it was a, a very, very deep, special moment that we enjoyed that we didn't expect at all. And so today we intend to take all of you on, on a journey, uh, a journey that will kind of walk us through the story of coexistence that humanity has done from, has done from the dawn of time, uh, as we've migrated across, uh, across the world, further and further into, into wild places. We've learned to coexist with wildlife, and that's really important. I'm CJ Colin, the Chief Executive Officer for the Wildlife Conservation Network, and on behalf of all the conservationists um, that we have the privilege of working with and the entire team at WCN, I want to welcome you to this very special day, the Wildlife Expo, which I think is the next best thing besides seeing wildlife directly uh, in the field. I think also it's, it's really special to have the opportunity to do so just a few days before, um, before Earth Days, because there's no greater way to celebrate Earth Day, this only Earth that we have, with all of its living species, its landscapes, its, uh, its fantastic and fascinating ecosystem functions that we're all codependent on and that really I think the, the, our well-being is dependent ultimately on the planet's well-being. And so we're going to celebrate Earth Day in a few days and we're starting early by, by being here at the Expo. Our mission at WCN is to protect animals um, by supporting conservationists who ensure that wildlife and people coexist and thrive. At WCN, we believe that real change comes from working uh, with communities through a community-led conservation approach because the people who are on the front line of conservation really know best what's needed to adapt and to be successful in the dynamic environment in which they work. And so we invest in that change through any number of, uh, of angles and lenses. We invest in local conservation organizations, our network of partners. We have 25 conservation partners and growing. We invest in local rising wildlife leaders, um, leaders at different points in their career. That's 217 individuals to date. And when appropriate, um, we leverage the collective impact of, uh, of conservation projects throughout the world, trying to reverse the decline of species in crisis across the entire range through our wildlife funds. These wildlife funds have granted over $100 million uh, to over 900 projects so far and counting. And throughout all this, we really believe in collaboration. Um, we believe in working together because core to all of this success is making sure that we connect with one another, making sure that we connect you, we, we connect your passion to the passion of the wildlife conservationists we work with so that these conservation entrepreneurs have all the tools that they need so that they can achieve their mission better and faster by having the resources they need to succeed. We offer you guidance uh, and peace of mind on your philanthropic investments because we are transparent and we put you directly in touch with these conservationists so that you can talk to them and you can have a direct sense of how your dollars are having an impact in the field. And so that level of direct and, and access is really core to, to how we work. 
and your generosity has been fantastic. We are deeply appreciative of all the trust and generosity that you've put into WCN. Uh, as you know, we guarantee that 100% of the funds that you uh, designate for particular projects will make it to that project in the field. And over the past 22 years, your generosity has uh, contributed over $350 million for conservation through WCN. So thank you so much. As I'm going through my thanks and gratitude, I want to extend our appreciation to the Wilson Santini Foundation, who's been uh, supportive of this expo. Uh, if any of you are interested also in supporting the expo by yourself or through your company, feel free to see us afterwards. And I also want to extend uh, a big, a big thank you to our entire WCN team. The lights are pretty bright, so I can't quite see, but if, uh, if anybody from WCN is in the room, if they could stand up for a quick round of applause. <laughs> it's a handful of them. We wouldn't be able to do this work without them. Uh, if you picked up who they are, they're also there to help you and help answer any questions, so feel free to go to them and we'll try to make sure that you have an extraordinary day. Back to today. Today really is designed so that we foster these connections. We want to take a really inspiring journey with you, a journey across the world, uh, from Africa, across the seas, into Asia, and into, um, into Latin America. You're going to be inspired by stories from these conservationists sharing lessons of coexisting with nature, sharing lessons of coexisting between wildlife and people. Uh, so that we can map out this future together. I believe that that future is, is possible because we're seeing successes uh, all along the way. But it's not just going to happen on stage. So we're going to have lots of people here on stage, but the day is really built to foster um, connections, and we want you to take advantage of that. So right outside the auditorium, we've built uh, breaks into the schedule. We've got booths. Please go do some shopping. Uh, please go talk to the conservationists so that you can find out there their work, uh, there are probably some people you already know, go talk to them, but also don't be shy and meet some of the new people. This is really important. I mean, the, the, this, this access, this connection, this relationship is, is core to, to our values at WCN. And we have a community that's fantastic. You may not all know each other, but I know that you all share at least one thing in common, and that's a passion for wildlife and a passion for a world where people and wildlife can coexist and thrive. So don't be shy. We're going to have 11 organizations presenting on stage, but we're actually going to have 18 organizations present um, here today and about I don't know, 35, 40-ish conservationists. So they can't all give a presentation, but I want to invite them on stage quickly. Uh, I'm not going to give them the mic. I'm just going to have them come here. You could put a name and a face together, and if you see a particular species you're interested in, kind of take a mental picture of that, uh, of that conservationist and then go talk to them. So without further ado, we're going to get started. And first, joining us as a guest speaker from uh, Kenya, the, from the Hirola Conservation Program. I'm going to ask you, by the way, to save your, your applause for afterwards, otherwise we won't go through all this. But first, joining us from Kenya, uh, Dr. Abdullahi Ali and Nishad Patel. <laughs> Come behind me. From, uh, from Cameroon, from one of our rising wildlife leaders, uh, Dr. Aristide uh, Takukam Kamla and Morgan Nigon. They don't need the applause. We're going to go through quickly. Now, next up, from Save the Elephants and EcoExist, and also representing the Elephant Crisis Fund, they'll be our first speaker, Dr. Chris Dallas and Dr. Anna Songhurst. From, now we're moving into our partners from the Indian Cat Alliance, Dr. Rocio Palacios. And from the Cheetah Conservation Fund in Namibia, uh, Brian Badger. From Conservation Through Public Health, working in Uganda, hopefully we're in the order of my slides, so I'm double-checking all this, Dr. Gladys Kalima Zikusoka and Lawrence Zikusoka. From uh, Proyecto TT in Colombia, Rosemira Guillen. From the Grevy Zebra Trust in Kenya, Peter Lalampa and David Kimiti. From the Macaw Recovery Network in Costa Rica, Dr. Sam Williams and uh, Jose Diaz. From Mariset in Malaysia, Dr. Luisa Ponampalam. From the Misul Foundation, one of our newest partners, working in Indonesia with coral reefs, Virli Yurikin. From the Okapi Conservation Program in the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, Lucas Mears and John Watkin. From Painted Dog Conservation in Zimbabwe, Peter Blinston. From Proyecto Washu, also one of our newest partners, working in Ecuador, Natalia Fuentes and Felipe Alfonso Cortes. From the Small Wildcat Conservation Foundation, working all over the world, wherever there are small cats, Dr. Jim Sanderson. 
from the Snow Leopard Conservancy, working across a range of snow leopards, uh, Ashley Lutz Nelson. From Spectacle Bear Conservation, working in Peru, Alex Mori and Robin Appleton. And finally, from the California Wildlife Program, my dear colleague, Neil Sharma. Please stand up, please kind of get closer to me, get closer to the front of the stage. <laughs> Give him a big round of applause. So you, you all can take a picture if you want to. They're quite photogenic in addition to their wonderful species. And I'm going to ask them to walk off stage as I introduce my next colleague. So maybe just walk behind me and we'll walk off stage. But thank you all for everything. We'll see you soon. So we're going to get started with all these presentations. And to get this day started, I want to invite up on stage uh, my dear colleague, uh, Dr. Zoe Nleko. Uh, Zoe hails from South Africa. Uh, she's also a fellow University of Florida Gator, mm -hmm. with a couple of us here actually on stage. Uh, she used to work with, uh, with rhinos and now leads our conservation network, uh, our, yes, our partners network. Um, and Zoe is a fantastic individual. She's got lots of energy. will take us through this first session. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Zoe. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, we're running late already. <laughs> this is a great start. But you know what we do. Those who are not new, they know. We are going to catch up. So good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Welcome back to any newcomers. Welcome, you'll be back, and we can't wait to have you back. So, we're gonna get started, and we're gonna get started with the first presenters. We have Chris and Anna, please come up. Chris is the director of the Elephant Crisis Fund, and he's been working on elephants for, yeah, a long time. More than 30 years in both Africa and Asia. The Elephant Crisis Fund is a fund of WCN, and he's been, him and his team have been working for like 10 years now, working with maybe 300 or so grantees, which are other projects who are working on elephants in other countries. And this is a treat today. We're starting with a treat. Anna is one such project. She's a grantee of the Elephant Crisis Fund, and she leads Eco Exist. And we are going to hear from the director of the fund and from a successful grantee of the fund. Take it away. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Three weeks ago, I was sitting next to a pool in the rainforest in Central Africa, a place called Nuabali and Doki, in the north of the Republic of Congo. And I was able to have the unique experience of watching this completely relaxed bull forest elephant cruising around in this pond, hoovering up the algae from the bottom and really enjoying himself. I'd previously been there in 2014, and it was a completely different situation then. The elephants were much less relaxed because there was a real poaching wave going on. Things were not, not at all easy. This was a problem across large parts of Africa and particularly in the rainforests, which are so difficult to protect. As you can see, Nobali and Doki, where the arrow is, it's the northern end of the, um, the great Central African rainforest. It's one of the last really intact areas there and it has really important populations of forest elephant and of, um, and of western lowland gorillas. So I'm the director of the Elephant Crisis Fund. This was set up 10 years ago as a collaborative venture between Save the Elephants and the Wildlife Conservation Network. And the idea was to respond to the massive ivory crisis by producing money quickly and with the minimum hassle to people who are working at the front line to try and stop this ivory crisis. Say so we've been going for 10 years now, we've granted out more than $35 million to over 100 grantees in 
44 different countries. So as you can see, we got a pretty good coverage of Africa, and we also funded anti-trafficking work in Asia. I try and visit as many of the projects as possible together with my team so that we can see what's actually going on in the field, what the needs are, and how people have been able to use our funding to best advantage. Nubali and Doki was really important and is one of our, our, our main um, destinations for funding because it was under such threat and it's such an important area for, for elephants. So for the last almost 10 years, we've been uh, providing them with funding for a, a range of things like vehicles, radios, setting up new forward operating bases, helping to get the rangers deeper into the forest to deal with the poachers. And I'm very glad to say, thanks primarily to the dedication of the people on the ground, but also with our support, the situation has completely turned around. There hasn't been a single elephant known, uh, poached, as far as we know, inside the park for the last two years. And <laughs> in many other the sites we've been supporting throughout Africa, we're seeing the same thing. Where there are big elephant populations, they're no longer a threat of extinction or even their numbers being necessarily pushed down by poaching. And this is due to a combination of factors. We don't know how much each one has come to play, but we've been involved in supporting each of these. One is just better management at a site level, better communications, better transport, people able to get in and do their work. Secondly, most of the major ivory traffickers are now in prison, many in New York. And that has been a huge success. People are scared to traffic ivory. It still takes place, but it's nothing like the level it was <laughs> 10 years ago. And the most, the most critical thing is that the Chinese said they would ban the domestic sale of ivory, and they've done that. And they've done it very effectively, and they have uh, engaged in law enforcement. There's much less ivory coming into China than there was, again, five to 10 years ago. So this is all good news for elephants. It's not such good news for small elephant populations. So if you've got a few thousand elephants, having 10 poached a year is not a big deal. If you've got 100 elephants, it does become a big deal. And this is a, a sort of new focus of our work, is, is these small, often critically important, isolated elephant populations where poaching is still a problem. And so this, this picture is from a camera trap in northern Angola. This is the southernmost elephant, forest elephant population in the world. Between 100 and 150 left. Four have already been killed by poachers this year, and that is unsustainable. And we're really worried this population is going to go extinct. We're supporting an organization called the Kasama Foundation, who are doing brilliant work, but they need support from the Angolan government to set up a protected area to actually patrol and provide law enforcement. And so this is the sort of the next stage we're going through, is how to encourage the Angolan government to really look after these elephants and recognize their significance. Now, turning back to Nubali and Doki, with the core park under control, the new focus is what happens outside. It's part of a large landscape that consists of the park plus logging concessions. Now, you may think, gosh, logging concessions, that's, that's a really bad thing. But actually, it's better than some of the alternatives. And well-managed logging concessions, like the ones around Nubali and Doki, are actually really important for wildlife. Two-thirds of the elephants in this landscape are not in the park, but are in the concessions. Luckily, they are working with good partners and who make sure that, say, when, when they finish logging in an area, doing selective logging, they close that area down, make sure that poachers can't get in there. This photograph actually shows you that that zigzag line is an old logging road that is now recovering. And some of these, some of these um, logging areas are, are really critical, both for elephants and for gorillas, and actually liked by them. So the next, our next phase is to help the Wildlife Conservation Society, who manage Nubali and Doki and these surrounding areas, to help extend the range of um, protection out beyond the park into the logging concessions. Worse things than logging happen. Again, this is from my trip three weeks ago. A village nearby has had its boundaries extended. Slash and burn farmers have come in, chopped down all the trees. They'll farm for three years or four years, and then they'll move on to the next site. This is actually a lot more environmentally damaging 
than, than the selective logging. And it, even more dangerous than small-scale expansion of farms is, is roads. This is the existing road that goes to the west of Nirbali and Doki. It's been the focus for the development of oil palm plantations that are very bad for wildlife. A new road is being built to the south of Nirbali, extending to the Central African Republic. And it's really important that this is planned so it just doesn't become a ribbon development with farms all the way along and movement of wildlife blocked by this. And this shows the importance of planning. Human development will take place, but it has to be planned to minimize its impact on wildlife. So here and elsewhere in Africa, our new crisis is the crisis of coexistence, allowing humans and elephants to live together. So even with the poaching crisis now at a low ebb, elephants are still in trouble. Last month, I was in South Sudan. There are three herds of elephants left in that country. There used to be 70,000. This herd, the week after I was there and took this photograph, started coming into conflict with pastoralists over access to water. The pastoralists would dig wells, the elephants would come in and drink all the water at night, and then they would find there's no water for their cattle the next day. They killed, the week after I was there, they killed a large part of this herd. We're supporting African parks who work there to build new wells outside the, um, the main area where the humans are. And we hope that this will at least save them next year. Um, it's really difficult. They're having, you can't get vehicles in. They're having to hire donkeys. This is something that happened you know, a few weeks ago, and the response is needed now. <clears throat> the Elephant Crisis Fund has this flexibility that we can deliver funding straight away and deal with these kinds of problems. But as I was saying, there's a change in the way we do things. We now have to think about how can elephants and people live together in landscapes where the human presence is inevitably increasing. We know that there is a demographic, call it a time bomb, that there will be a big increase in human populations in all of these areas. We are going to lose more natural habitats. We're going to lose elephant habitat. But the important thing is that that loss is minimized. We also know there's light at the end of the tunnel. Population growth rates are going down. We can see towards the second half of the century that there will be stabilization, that this is not in vain. We're trying to help shepherd the wildlife through to what comes after this the, the rise in human populations. So while we are still supporting the ivory, trying to keep the ivory truck crisis under control, our new focus of effort is on trying to promote human elephant coexistence. Luckily, within Save the Elephants, which is providing the technical support to the Elephant Crisis Fund, um, the, we, we have a team, including Lucy King, who works with the, both for Save the Elephants and for the Elephant Crisis Fund, who are experts in dealing with coexistence. So last year, she produced, with her team, she produced this human elephant conflict coexistence toolbox, which gives ideas to people living all across Africa how to mitigate the impact of elephants on their livelihoods. That's one part, which is the mitigation. That's a short-term approach. It will be needed in long-term, but for the long-term for things to work, we need to encourage people to do good land use planning. Now, the toolbox has been rolled out across Africa, and when we go and do our site visits, we bring copies of the toolbox with us. We talk through with the people on the ground what's likely to work for their local circumstances. This is an example of one of the pages. This is on beehive fences, which was the approach that Lucy um, discovered in Kenya and has now rolled out to many parts of Africa. It has been very successful. You can see in Tanzania, these elephants are not going through that fence. But there are other places where it doesn't work so well. If it's too dry, bees need water. It doesn't work there. If it's too wet, there tends to be disease. So in Central Africa, we're finding that, that electric fences seem to work better. However, they are expensive and they're difficult to maintain. So other approaches are likely to be necessary 
in different places. Now, not, it's not just a question of how you protect the farms and the people. It's also a question of doing this in, in an efficient way. And how people farm, how they develop new farming areas is really important. So this is a place called Upemba in the Southern Democratic Republic of Congo. It's one of the most dangerous parks in the world because of the Mai Mai rebels. It is also where the last savannah elephants of the Democratic Repub Republic of Congo are living, between 100 and 200. And as you can see here, you've got manioc fields that are like two or three kilometers away from the villages. The elephants go and raid these crops. They probably don't even realize they're coming into people's farms. So we're helping Forgotten Parks Foundation, who are working here, to try and reduce the conflict and reduce the level of killing retribution killing that is taking place that is again in danger of driving this population to extinction. This sort of setup is much better where you have a, a hard division where there is a degree of um, planning so you have areas that are for wildlife, areas that are for farming. Land use planning its very challenging because we're used to dealing with wildlife departments and not with the ministries, like ministers of planning and of agriculture that deal with this sort of stuff. Also, you need to deal with local government. And some ECF grantees have started to address this issue. And the person who's probably made the most progress here is, or the organization is EcoExist in Botswana. And so we're very fortunate to have Anna Songhurst and her team today, since her organization is really at the cutting edge of this work. Thank you, Chris. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's lovely to be here. So I'm now going to take you to the beautiful Okavango Delta, which is in northern Botswana. And in Botswana, we've got the largest population of elephants in the world. Actually, it's now estimated to be around 127,000. So it's doing really well. Um, but with such a big population of elephants, um, the biggest need for them is space. They need to be able to move between resource areas, be able to connect with other places. And so some of their biggest threats, really, to this population of elephants is where habitat has changed, where um, migration routes are blocked, and where the, the range is expanding into areas where people are living than human-elephant conflict. So my name is Anna Songhurst. I'm a director and co-founder of EcoExist, and we work to try and reduce human-elephant conflict and foster coexistence. And we're based up in the Okavango Delta. And in the area we work, there's about 20,000 elephants and about 40,000 people. And so in this area, elephants move from dry land areas um, up where the, the rainfield pans are, and they come down to the Okavango Delta and the lush swamps that are there for the resources that they need. So they need water and grasses and fruit. Uh, likewise, we have people who, are now, um, who have settled along the edge of the, the Okavango River and the top of the delta for the same reasons, to access the resources that the delta provides, water, fruits, grasses, and most people in this area are subsistence farmers. And so the elephants here, they use quite distinct movement routes to get um, from the, the dry lands down to the delta. Um, in, and most elephants are using most of these routes most of the time, and we call those ones elephant corridors. And so they're kind of navigating their way through where there's fields and settlements. And in the past, what's happened here is that land use planning has been quite haphazard. So fields have been allocated in different places. Sometimes they've been allocated next to or on elephant corridors. And that actually has increased the risk of people to being raided by elephants. So elephants coming in and raiding their crops. Oops. Um, oh. All right. um, and also what happens is where the elephant corridors are coming down and bisecting with um, the road, which is the main kind of route that the people can take to get between settlements, maybe to get to the clinic or for children to get to school, you end up with direct interactions between people and elephants. And that can actually lead to sometimes um, injury and sometimes fatalities for both people and elephants in the area. So what we've been doing with EcoExist is trying to address this root cause of conflict, trying to see how can we um, develop some long-term solutions and see how people and elephants can share space. So we've been mapping and monitoring elephant movement routes um, throughout the whole of the Okarango Delta. 
um, by doing ground surveys, looking at um, footprints, uh, getting indigenous knowledge from the local community on where elephants are moving, and also putting the satellite collars on to, to monitor individual movements. And we've now mapped 68 uh, elephant corridors around the whole of the Okavango Delta, so the east, west, and the southern parts. Um, and we had the chance to now incorporate this information into what are called land use planning tools, um, which will then help the land authorities to be able to plan and allocate land so that there are minimal land use conflicts. Um, so this involves kind of bringing in data on the, the movements of elephants. It involves um, bringing in data from the local community on preference for land use, and also considers the, the government needs and the, the policy implications for land use planning. And so what comes out of this type of uh, a tool, it's an ESRI-based GIS mapping tool. You get these kind of maps, which can then help the land authorities to see where there's the green areas, which are good agricultural soils for future arable development, with minimal conflicts. So those will be areas outside of the elephant corridors. And it also allows them to show where elephant corridors are. And the land authorities have now agreed that they won't allocate fields or settlements inside these elephant corridors anymore. Um, and then we take these maps and this information back to the communities to make sure that it's verified, make sure people understand that um, this is what the maps have come out with, make sure that they are in agreement that this is where the corridors are. We do the same thing with the government departments, making sure that land authorities or Department of Agriculture or Department of Wildlife, that everyone is on board. Um, and we also work with the, the technical officers um, just to make sure that they can use this tool um, to help them with land use planning in the future. And then we've been demarcating all of the elephant corridors, making sure that people know where they are, and that helps to create awareness as well about what a corridor is and how you should behave when you're on one. And then human-elephant conflict, as Chris said, is a really complicated topic. It requires thinking about the long-term solutions, but also thinking about the short-term solutions and the immediate needs of people. So we do a lot of work on trying to see how to protect kind of cluster field areas outside of corridors with things like solar electric fences, and then also with individual farmers working with Save the Elephants and Lucy King, as you can see here, um, to look at uh, different mitigation techniques like beehive fences or chili deterrents. And then we're also looking at this aspect of safety, so where children are uh, needing to get to school and then they, they can't reach school because they're scared and as they're coming across elephants. We developed this scheme called the Elephant Express Buses, which now helps to transport children to school across the corridor safely. And now the next step is to think about how do you bring benefits back to people um, for keeping these elephant corridors open. So we're now working on ways to do that, and that's how we're going to be able to then maintain these corridors moving into the future. Okay. So, Anna, thank you very much for this fascinating insight and show how important planning is to help securing a future for elephants. So the Elephant Crisis Fund we've been, has been able to pivot to the new threats that are opposed towards elephants. And although the ivory crisis has not completely gone away, it has reduced, we are now focusing our attention on trying to deal with these problems of these small elephant populations that are in trouble, trying to support the, the large areas of elephant habitat that are critical for long-term survival, and to promote human-elephant coexistence both through dealing with the immediate problems through these mitigation measures and trying to encourage good planning so human impact is going to be minimized as far as possible. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Chris and Anna. Quick reminders, please put your phone on silent. Otherwise, we'll answer it for you <laughs> if it rings. Next up, we're not walking too far. This is a walking journey, by the way. Like, there were no cars back in the day. So we need a bit of water, so we're still, like, in Kenya. We're moving to Kenya, and please join me on stage. We have Peter and David, who work for the Gravy Zebra Trust. For those who know, um, and maybe those who don't know, Peter's... WCN's board member, but every time he comes here, he complains that there are no cows on the streets. So if you, if you know somebody who knows somebody, please get us cows for next time. It's for his viewing pleasure. And making his debut, WCN, um, is David over here, who is the resident geek. 
and he claims he's a recovering nerd. We haven't seen that yet. <laughs> um, he's an astrophotographer in his spare time. Have him show you his work. And I'm also going to introduce, but he's going to come up later, Dr. Ali. Ali started the, he works for the Hirola. Have you heard of the Hirola before? Hirola Conservation Program, because the Hirola is critically endangered in Kenya. He'll tell you all about that later, but to start, let's hear from the Gravy Zebra Duo. Uh, thank you, and thank you. It's such a honor and pleasure to be here. I know when um, people ask a first question that I want to ask, how many of us know that there are three species of zebra? Mm. Impressive. <laughs> and there are three species of zebra, and two of them are doing well. One of them is endangered, and that's the grave zebra. They are left less than 3,000 in the world. And Sorry, it's all about technology. Um, my community, the Samburu, where I come from, live in this landscape where the graves are. Historically, they were found in the north horn of Africa, but they moved down the Nile to their current home, that's Samburu. In this landscape, it's dotted with open grassland, bushy areas, and beautiful hills and mountains. But this area is also historically an area where communities move from one area to another in search of pasture and water. So movement is a very critical component of my community. It's the lifestyle of my community. As they search for pasture and water, that movement in itself is very important to maintain land health. This is just a picture that shows cows getting out of their kraal, going out in search of pasture. It's an area that doesn't have any development such as tarmac, no concrete building. And for me, coming from such a landscape, when I landed here and went to New York and saw all the tall buildings, it was an aha moment for me. It's something that I've never seen. So movement is a very important part to maintain land held in this community. I'm fortunate enough and lucky to have been born and brought up in this landscape, where before I joined school, I was able to go and take care of livestock. And as, as I go out taking care of livestock, I learned very valuable lessons about the landscape. Because looking at the gravies and other herbivores and how vigilant they are in the landscape told me when the predators were there. And that means I needed to tighten my hiding skills. I needed to tighten my hiding skills to protect the cows, the goats that I was hiding. It's also an area where I learned where to get water. There's no running taps. So I followed the tracks of gravis and other affuels to be able to track where there's water and that's where I quench my thirst together with the livestock. I also follow the tracks of the gravies to trace where there's pasture, and that enabled me to save livestock by making sure that I'm able to secure their grazing. The same corridors that are used by livestock to look for pasture to look for water, are very critical for graves as well as other wildlife. Their movement from one area enables them to reach to areas where they can get water as well as get pasture. Allow me to take you through a journey, and a journey of one of our colored gravy. We call her Namunyak. And we call Anna Munyak because she was resilient enough. I remember the last time I was here, I was appealing for support of feeding the zebra. Namunyak was lucky enough, she's one of the lucky females, to have survived that drought. 
When we call at Namnyak, we call at Namnyak in Westgate Community Conservancy. From this map, this particular, oh sorry. Sorry, I can't see the pointer. But in the middle of the map, where we see a belly belly grazing area, is where we call it Namnyak. After coloring Namnyak, Namnyak spend that 80 days around a belly belly area because of the grazing. We did an animation of Namnyak to see where did she go after the 38 days. And this is what happened. Namunyak moved from Westgate to Sambur National Reserve, then went back to Nebelibeli, one of the critical areas for grazing. There is a place called Loijuk, where she knew very well that I could get water in Loijuk. Then she moves, staying in the West Mibai Community Conservancy, where it's a hotspot breeding area for gravies. She knew when to cross roads such as the A2 road, and she was very keen enough to know the timing to avoid being knocked by vehicles. For Namunyak and her fall to be able to survive, to be able to access the resources, movement is very critical. Just like the, my community, the Samburu community, movement is very critical for them, just as Namunyak and her fall. And what are we doing? to make sure that this movement is not curtailed with development that's coming up. I'm going to invite my colleague, David Kimiti, to take you through some of our strategies that we use to secure the corridors for Namnyak, as well as my community in Samburu. Karibu, David. Thank you, Peter. Um, yeah, so our first strategy is uh, leveraging citizen science and expert indigenous knowledge to help us collect data. Um, this is one of our scouts that is approaching a gravy zebra herd to collect data on them. Uh, and that just sort of shows you the type of landscapes that we are dealing with. Um, and we work in a vast area because the gravy zebra range is so large and we're one of the few organizations dedicated to it. We have to cover an area of about one million hectares. Uh, to do this successfully, we need a network of uh, community members that we rely on to, to help us collect data on the gravy zebra and its habitat. And these community members um, patrol their areas, their homes around where they live, um, and we work with them to, to really be able to collect uh, information critically. Like Peter, they've grown up in this landscape. They understand, they deeply understand the ecology of their own land, and we have to leverage their knowledge, and uh, uh, especially the tracks and where animals are and where they'll be going to drink to, to, to allow us to collect uh, information. And just to give you an example of how important the information is, one of the data, some of the data collected by, by some of our scouts in Meibai, near the breeding area where you saw Namunyak go to have a fall, um, there was a pipeline that was being uh, constructed, that was being designed to be constructed through, and it was going to cut through the breeding area. But luckily we had sighting data from our scouts in the area and we were able to take that to the government and the planning agencies and show them that there was a critical breeding area. And because of that, they were able to reroute the pipeline to avoid that critical breeding area. So, <laughs> so we work with multiple partners in the landscape, including Wasa Lions and Save the Elephants, uh, to collect this information. Using this critical um, citizen science data, the knowledge from the scouts, the ambassadors, and the warriors that we work with, uh, together with cutting edge GPS caller information to provide information to uh, decision makers. So the Kenya National Highway Authority, the, 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 the Kenya Rural Roads Authority, and other development agencies in the area that are, are, pro are, are creating uh, large-scale linear infrastructure in the area. We provide a multi-species image of wildlife crossing points. We provide hotspots where animals are being hit. And because of our information and the information of the different partners, we're able to make sure that we are putting in mitigation measures um, for, for, for those animals to allow them to cross. And so working with different partners in the, in the landscape, we're able to provide this good picture. Also, because we work with uh, the communities and we are fully embedded, we are able to get information. Uh, we have a very vast intelligence network where uh, community members are able to tell us when they see things happening in the, in the field. Uh, these two boys were out herding uh, some months back. 
and they ran into a fall that had fallen into a, into a gully, into one of the, in one of the degraded areas in the place, and the fall couldn't get out by itself. And they reached out again to one of our scouts, one of our community scouts, who helped us reach out to the Kenya Wildlife Service and uh, organize an expedition to go rescue the fall. And we were able to rescue the fall and uh, uh, try and uh, reunite it with its herd, and we were happy that the, herd were, the, the fall was able to, to reconnect with its mother. So, so not only were we able to save this fall, but it really uh, underscores our focus on restoration in the area. By, by restoring these landscapes that have been degraded, we are able to ensure that there's continuous and safe movement of people and wildlife through this region. Uh, we, we have some programs that we are doing that with. Um, and while for some people it might seem like it's a, it's a pipe dream to, to restore, if you've been to these uh, rangelands, you might know what I mean, uh, to restore these areas, uh, we have seen that through working with the communities, they have the power in their own hands to actually uh, re return these landscapes from degraded areas that have, uh, are characterized by, by erosion and surface runoff into healthy, productive lands that are able to provide vegetation for uh, both their livestock and the, and the communities as well as uh, diverse wildlife. And this is our second strategy, the Rangeland Monitoring Program, and I'm going to hand back over to Peter to finalize and just tell you a little bit about uh, what we are doing with that. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, David, and thanks for highlighting some of the strategies that we use to ensure that, uh, you know, Namnyak and my community, Samburu, are having their good time in Samburu. As David has highlighted, that land health is a very key component of what we do as Grave Zebra Trust. We work with the local communities. They know their land very well. They are the custodians that will make sure that whatever that we need to make this land healthy is done well. And one of the methods is regenerative grazing. And regenerative grazing is where they control their livestock movement to make sure that livestock go grazing in the right place at the right time to avoid overgrazing. This is a picture of some of the village-based committee members working with their community, looking at the map in terms of livestock movement and ensuring that they have consensus with the community on where their livestock will be grazing. It's not just a grazing plan within a paper. They go out to the field. And as they go out to the field, they mark these grazing blocks with the natural features, such as hills, river, you know, banks, uh, mountains, valleys, and to ensure that they know within the community where these grazing blocks are and where they're going to get the water. We've spent many years working with communities to ensure that we build this momentum, to ensure that we make sure that the land becomes healthy. This momentum really requires us to make sure that we work with the communities. We borrow the indigenous knowledge in ensuring that land comes back to health. And that's just one side of the coin. The other side of the coin is where our grassland champions, women, are leading a movement of restoration by constructing half-moon structures called semicircular bands, and they recede those areas. These half-moon structures control runoff when it rains. It captures the moisture, and that enables the grass to grow. We've seen so far 12,000 barns being constructed by these women, leading to islands of healthy areas that initially it was bare ground. But with these barns and with the receding, these are the kind of pictures we've seen. These are the kind of movement that we're seeing, community leading from the front. And as they do that, wildlife benefit. Gravis are one of the beneficiaries. Because in one of these areas where we had regenerative plant grazing, we had 600 gravis spending more than four months grazing in this area, an area that they have never spent such length of time. And it's not just because of the grass being in abundance. It's also about creating space for gravies to be able to graze freely without disturbance. So we are at this point where we've been able to survive the long drought of three years. It's that moment when we want to kick the numbers. We are at 3,000 gravies. 
And for us to be able to achieve this, it's time to double our investment to make sure that we scale our rangeland work, to make sure that we scale our network of citizen science that gives us all the intelligence. It's time to double our investment to make sure that we increase the number of gravies from 3,000 to more gravies in this landscape. And in order for us to do that, we need support. We need support to be able to make our warriors reach out to some very harsh environment. We need support to build this new program that connects between Samburu, Isiolo, and Lake Hippia, because graves have shifted from the north to the south, and we want to know more about this shift. We also need support to make sure that we have a full-time dedicated staff working in this area to be able to collect the data and engage the community. And having said that, I really want to say thank you. Thank you to WCN. Thank you to our supporters for all the amazing support. Because we couldn't have walked this journey without all of you. Thank you. And so it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ali. Dr. Ali, who works with the Irola, is a pastoralist like me. He's grown in the same landscape. He's worked in the same landscape. And I'm sure he's a pastoralist like me who has the initial interaction of, you know, going out and hiding and interacting with wildlife and learning from nature. So Dr. Ali, Karibu. Asante. Thank you, David and Peter. Um, yes, um, so uh, to start off, uh, let's shift gears a little bit and move further east in to eastern Kenya. David and Peter work in northern Kenya, and I work in further east in areas along the Kenyan Somali border. And in this presentation, I will discuss how we are using similar strategies to save two other globally endangered species, the Hirola antelope and the reticulated giraffe. This is not a goat garden giraffe. They just share space with humans. This is the Hirola antelope. It's, the world, it's considered as the world's most endangered antelope. And we are working toward protecting the last 500 individuals. They declined from about 16,000 in the 1960s to less than 500 today. And, but before we go into that, uh, I want to tell you a little bit about northeastern Kenya. This is a vast region, 121,000 square kilometers, stretching from the southern tip of Kenya to Ethiopian border on the north. And there are three counties in there, Garissa, Ujia, and Mandera. The communities that are living in these areas are primarily Somalis, and they are nomadic. This area has the highest concentration of livestock anywhere in Kenya. And the communities historically kept cows, camels, and goats. And you can see this is a typical village in northeastern Kenya. How many people can see giraffe in there? In that photo? Yeah. Uh, so wildlife is also thriving here. I grew up, I was born and raised here. Uh, both of my parents were nomadic pastoralists. Uh, they still had their cows and goats and they still um, out, out there, and they, they refused to move to town. Uh, so I'm the only one who has moved from the family into urban areas. And within these landscapes, wildlife is part of us. As you can see, even the, the kids playing, the giraffe is the referee uh, <laughs> for this match, as you can see. And as Peter talked about mobility, uh, communities here move from one point to another. And camels are the primary means 
of movement here. They're very resilient, and people love them for their milk and meat. And even myself, when I was very young, uh, you know, I really liked enjoy, uh, enjoying the camel rides. Uh, being on top there, on the camel hump, is really comfy, and, and it's the primary means of transport that we use uh, in this area. So people uh, in this area face very extreme um, climate scenarios. Rainfall is very variable. Drought is a common factor. And there is also a flooding that happens often when it rains. But amid this chaos, uh, this region has the largest concentration of reticulated giraffe. About 11,000 of them call this area home. And it's the most important part of their range. Yet, it is the most vulnerable part of the range as well. Given that this area lacks formal government protected areas and is also close to the Somali border. So there are constant threats facing these giraffes. In this picture alone, uh, probably over 30 individuals are here. So they are thriving and they are also breeding with, uh, and flourishing uh, in this area. Thanks to the protection that we're providing uh, to these uh, giraffes. In, with these giraffes, also co-occur with the world's most endangered antelope called the Hirola. The Hirola is also known as the four-eyed antelope. It's an endemic species just restricted to southern Garissa, one particular county, and historically occurred on portions of Somalia but now they're extinct in Somalia. There are only 500 of them left, and the Hirola is the only representative of the entire genus in which they are. So they are really important, even evolutionarily, and the information that they carry. It's a really important species globally. Uh, because we are close to where the areas where Peter is working, uh, also the gravies extend to our area, uh, and we have an isolated population that co-occur with the giraffes uh, and the herola. And the herola and the giraffes also uh, share range. Uh, as you can see, they co-occur together and, uh, and, and flourish together. In this region, these animals compete with livestock. Historically, communities in this area uh, were livestock keepers. But because of climate change and rainfall variability, uh, people have stopped now livestock keeping. And they have turned into more browsing species. Cattle require grass. If there's drought and lack of rain, it's very hard to have grass throughout. So people are now have shifted to adopt to that situation to camel keeping. And and, and, and uh, water is a big issue here, very big issue. One of the biggest problems to deal with is water. And also, there are a lot of goods in this area. People, uh, because of the trees and the grass and the lack of grass, people have also uh, kept the grass, uh, keep the, the goods. This. Water is also a big problem here for the goods as well. So Hassan, I want to introduce one farmer who we work with. Uh, he was one of those pastoralists who was keeping cows in that region, in this region. Uh, but over time, Hassan lost all his cows because of the drought. All the water pans have become dry. The giraffes have also paid a price. Uh, because of lack of uh, browse, as you can see, the trees behind them, is, there's no foliage. Uh, if they don't have anything to eat, you see even they have skin problem. Uh, so they end up in homesteads, 
trying to feed on uh, one of the last standing trees uh, with foliage. Herolas are also equally affected. Uh, as you can see, they really get emaciated when they don't have sufficient food. Uh, warthogs, uh, we were driving, and uh, this is one individual we found alive, uh, but it was too late to save. Uh, as you can see, uh, all this is impact of drought. Uh, in addition, we have invasive species that have affected the habitats of giraffes. This is mesquite uh, colonizing part of the range of the giraffe, and it forms thick, impenetrable, uh, th thick thickets that are hard to traverse through. Luckily, we have the Tana River, Kenya's longest river that cuts through uh, the part of this land. So Hassan, the farmer that I, the, the pastoralist I introduced, moved from 400 miles from where he used to keep cows and moved to sections of the Tana River to set up a farm, uh, change of livelihoods, uh, from pastoralism uh, to farming. And one of the key crops that he planted was mangoes. Mangoes takes about four years to mature. Because mangoes are preferred by giraffes who have been affected by climate, like Hassan, they, the, the giraffes sneak into his farm and they eat the flowers. So they strip off the flowers. So after waiting for four years, he ended up losing the mangoes to the giraffes. And then floods hit and sweep the riverbank, taking part of his mangoes, and even accessing the farmlands becomes the farm becomes an issue as well. So we are working with Hassan and other farmers to come up with coexistence uh, a program where we are, we have talked to these farmers and come up with a strategy to help them tolerate giraffes. And one way we have done this is by introducing a lime project. Giraffes love mangoes, but they don't like lime. <laughs> so we, we linked Hassan, we advised Hassan to plant lime instead of mangoes. So he, and then we linked him to companies in Nairobi to buy directly the lime. We have also helped in riverbank restoration where we help to protect his farm from flooding. In that way, Hassan now loves conservation and loves giraffes and he's collaborating with us. In addition, we are also helping restore habitat for Hirola. Now that we don't have the elephants, we are working with communities to thin down invasive trees and introduce grass or recede those landscapes. landscapes. In addition, we also have anti-poaching teams that are, protecting, that are protecting the giraffes and helping with the coexistence program. We have also talked and have a farmers network that we are working with in the entire area where we are collaboratively working towards solutions of uh, coexistence between the farmers and the giraffe. Recently, we set up an uh, educational center where we're educating young school-going children about the plights of these giraffes and also 
the local livelihood. We talk to them about local wildlife species uh, and other educational programs such as restoration efforts. Uh, and we have almost 180 students visit this facility every month. So the future of Hirola, this little calf, is Hirola, and this is giraffe, as you can see, this little cute giraffe. And the future of Hassan and his family are all intertwined. So together, and with the support provided by you all, is helping us to integrate the needs of all and to secure future for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Ali. Um, last but not least in this session, we have Gladys, who leads the Conservation Through Public Health, who in 2024 are celebrating 20 years of saving the critically endangered mountain gorillas in Uganda. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm very excited to be here at the World WCN Expo. I'm actually here with another of our founder members, Lauren Zikusoka, my husband. And we've been working with mountain gorillas for a long time. I personally have worked with them for, I would say, close to 30 years. Shows how old I am. <laughs> and I started out as a vet student in 1994. I'd always wanted to be a vet, and once I got to Windy Forest, which you can see in the picture, I, was, I fell in love with the place, I fell in love with the gorillas, the community, and I've never left. <laughs> um, but one of the main reasons why I was hired was because of disease. Everybody was concerned that gorilla tourism had begun, and people were going to make the gorillas sick. We share over 98% material, genetic material, and can easily make each other sick. So in this presentation, I'm going to talk about a need that we have, the work that we've been doing, and how we are going to focus more on habitat loss. And as Zoe said, we celebrated 20 years of conservation through public health. Um, it's been a very interesting journey. Uh, how many of you have seen mountain gorillas, actually? Fantastic, many of you. Well, mountain gorillas are so amazing. I'm sure when you saw them, you must have felt like that. They are so similar to us. And when I saw my first mountain gorilla, I felt a really deep connection. And I felt I really wanted to protect them. The, they have families just like us. The fathers are very protective over the children and the families. The moms are very good mothers. I've learned how to be a good mother from the gorillas, <laughs> watching them for many years. And the babies like to play a lot. They like to play just like our sons. We have two sons and they like to show off also in front of tourists. Um, we have been mainly focusing on disease because I'm a trained vet and that's the main reason why we set up conservation through public health when people made gorillas sick. And, oops, trying to get the video to play. Oh well, it's not played. <laughs> and um, so we analyze the samples from the mountain gorillas and look for diseases that they could have and from these samples, we're able to find out if they're picking up diseases from people or livestock, and then see whether to treat the people, the livestock, or the gorillas. And we have a Gorilla Health and Community Conservation Center. That's our third founder member, Stephen Rubanga, analyzing the samples. How many of you have visited our center at Buhoma? Fantastic. <laughs> you can see that we have the best view of the whole forest, panoramic view of the whole of Windy Forest. And during COVID, we found out that you know, people can easily make gorillas sick also with COVID, and we carried out a lot of education about how to prevent COVID between people and gorillas working with the rangers. And we also continued to carry out this education in the communities where we changed their behavior. We got pe many more people adopted hand washing stations during the pandemic, which really helped. 
Um, and over here, we now get our village health and conservation teams to go to people's homes and turn homes into model households. So homes that were originally, you know, not having hand washing stations, people don't have drying racks, but now they're getting better, cleaner homes, so that if gorillas happen to go into their compound, they're less likely to get sick. We started out in 20, 2007, 15 years ago, when we had only about, you know, we're reaching 2,000 homes and 26 volunteers, but now we have over 400 volunteers reaching 10,000 homes with 50,000 people. <laughs> and over time, we're finding that as community health is improving, gorillas are falling sick less often from human diseases, which is really amazing. And that is extremely important because if we continue to improve the community health and well-being, the gorillas are going to have a much more secure future. And as you can see, they're completely adorable. Um, <laughs> I was going to put in a photograph of a gorilla that's just been born this week, but it didn't quite make it. I got the news last night. And this, gorilla, this baby gorilla was born to a female called Furaha in the Kuringo Gorilla Group, which faced a tragedy during the pandemic. This particular, the silverback of the group was killed by a bushmeat poacher who was hunting diker and bush pig. And so the group split because they didn't want to be headed by a black buck, Ramutwe, then he became a silverback, and Furaha has had a baby this week, which is wonderful. And so to do, owing to these successful conservation efforts, which we are proud to have contributed to, along with other partners, the mountain gorilla numbers are steadily increasing, which is wonderful. When I first started working with them in 1997, there were only, you know, we, we counted 300 mountain gorillas on that very first census at Gwindi to add to the 315 Burungas to make 650. And they were considered the most critically, one of the most critically endangered species in the whole world. But as we speak now, because of the positive growth trend, as much as there's only just over 1,000 left in the world, IUCN dropped the status from critically endangered to endangered. And so it's all really good and we're really excited. But we're a little bit concerned about the fact that as the numbers of gorillas are going up, they're in a very tiny protected area of only 321 square kilometers. There isn't enough space for them to grow. And with tourism, which has helped people to coexist with gorillas, comes development. And I think when you come to Bwindi, you see there's a lot of development around the area, and there isn't much space for the gorillas to go, either from the lodges, the buildings, when people come, and agriculture. There's a very hard edge between the community and the park. Almost all around Bwindi, you come across this hard edge. Um, there's only one area where there's a buffer zone for tea, and so you tend to have situations where gorillas are always going outside the park. Why do they do it? Because they used to live, before their habitat was cut, they used to range in these areas. And now they've lost their fear of people through tourism and research. They, they can venture outside the park into community land. So this black buck from the southern sector is going out to see what he can find in community land. And this is a very common occurrence. So when they get out there, they like to eat the bark of trees. They encourage people, we encourage people to plant eucalyptus trees or you know, softwood trees so that they don't have to go into the forest for firewood. But the gorillas love the bark. So of course, this sometimes upsets the community members because it's their livelihood. They also like eating banana plants. Um, they actually prefer the, the plant and the stem to the fruit because of the moisture that they get from there. So they destroy the whole plant, and this really annoys the farmers. So this is what you get when you, you get in those areas where the mountain gorillas are found, banana plantations just outside the park. So today, I would like you to join us on a journey. This is Bwindi Impenetrable National Park, only 321 square kilometers. It's equivalent to San Francisco and Oakland, actually, together, with a bay bridge in the middle, if you can see that area in the middle, um, which is the Bay Bridge, whoops. And we often find that the gorillas are mainly in the southern sector, and they go a little bit into the north sector, but just at the bottom, Habinyanja Gorilla Group is always found at the neck. And this narrow neck threatens the integrity of windy forest, because as long as people keep 
encroaching on that habitat, that neck is going to be cut and you won't be able to connect the northern and southern sectors. And so we've been speaking to farmers and other community members around that area to see if they're willing to sell their land to expand protected habitat for gorillas. We want to be able to make sure that the bridge doesn't break down <laughs> so that people can still get between San Francisco and Oakland. <laughs> and so we've interviewed farmers and in some areas, especially on the east side, as over 90% of the community members want to sell their land because they can't plant any crops. Even if they try to plant crops, gorillas, baboons, and other wildlife come onto their farms and their areas, so they're not able to plant any crops, and they really want to sell the land. But it's also a race against time, because if we don't buy it, they're going to sell it to the lodges, because now that COVID is going down, the lodges are beginning to rebuild, and they will still sell it to other people, and then the gorillas will be fenced in. So why we're worrying about that, we're continuing to support the rangers to monitor the health of the gorillas. And thank you so much, WCN, for enabling us to do this. The gorillas are continuing to be, you know, then to be healthy and everything is going well. But we also work with the gorilla guardians, who are a group of community volunteers who had gorillas back when they come out. These are very brave men from the community who, whenever the gorillas come out, they safely had them back so people and gorillas don't get hurt. They're very... <laughs> <laughs> so the original name was actually Hugo, Human and Gorilla Conflict Resolution Team. And I mentioned how we started off with the Hugos in my book, Working with Gorillas, when a gorilla came out of the park and we tried to dart the gorilla to, to bring him out and he just kept running, running, running because he was partially habituated. And finally, everyone said, we need a group like the Hugo members. So we're really excited about them. They are very brave. They chase away big silverbacks like him and get him back into the park. And so they have a very important role they play. And during the pandemic, we got them to also herd gorillas back wearing masks. Anyone who comes within 10 meters of a gorilla has to put on a mask. They also collect fecal samples from the gorillas in the night nest. And we are, we, we are excited and relieved that we've not found COVID in any of the gorillas. And thank you so much, WCN, for enabling us to put up these measures in time during the pandemic. <laughs> so this is when we celebrated 20 years and the center was officially opened by the Queen of Buganda, our patron. And we continue to work with the women around the park because of our One Health approach to conservation. They promote family planning so people have manageable families. They <laughs> They give injections, family planning injections. They really get people to be healthy and hygienic, which in turn helps the gorillas. We also give them group livestock projects. And recently we started this Ready to Grow program, which was again supported by WCN. And even the poacher's wife, who's, who killed Rafiki, was one of the beneficiaries of the Ready to Grow, because she was very, very poor. And, he, and her husband was put in jail during that time. We also work with coffee farmers bordering the park, give them a good price for coffee so that they don't have to enter the park to poach and collect firewood. And so all of this is helping to keep the gorillas healthy, but we can only get their habitat secure if we are able to buy this land. It's about a thousand acres for the first phase, and the, farm, the community members are willing to sell it. If we don't buy it, they can sell it to the lodges and the gorillas will continue to be locked in. So I'm asking you to join us in this journey so that we can really raise money to be able to expand the habitat so that the number of growing gorillas continues to grow. There are just 1,000 left in the whole world, about 500 at Bwindi, but if we are able to buy this land, then the numbers will continue to increase as we continue to buy more land. And for more information, please scan to donate through WCN and visit our website and our booth outside, buy some coffee, by walking with gorillas and join us on this journey and come and visit us for those who haven't been able to visit us in Windy yet. Thank you so much. Thanks, Gladys. So I know you have burning questions, but I didn't forget. I just sort of like moved us along so that we had more time. Um, so we're going to take a break.
for the marketplace, um, which is all outside. That's where you're going to ask all of your burning questions from everyone who's been on stage and everyone who's coming on stage later. That's also where you can get your merch and all that good stuff. So, so that we are back on time, the next session, when we make it into the ocean, starts at 2.45, which means your butt must be on the seat before 2.45, so that we start at 2.45. And another announcement is that if anyone is interested in live captioning, there should be a QR code behind me, maybe. Um, if not, it will be on the check-in desk so that you can actually follow along and read what people are saying up here. You've been great. We'll see you soon.
outside, it's, it's ready if you want to do it. Once you get outside the Please start making your way back to the theater. We are going to get started in about five minutes.
Welcome back, everybody. Please grab your seats. We're going to get started with the next session. You made it on time. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed the, the visit to the Marketplace booths. They'll be here all day till 5 p.m. Um, but we're going to start the next session, which is all about the oceans. And I remember the first time that I was paddling out on a surfboard just here in San Francisco in Ocean Beach. And I remember when I felt the momentum of the Pacific Ocean behind me. You know, it wasn't just one swell of waves in San Francisco, but you could feel the strength of the entire Pacific Ocean pushing me around. And that strength is so, so forceful. It's a reminder of how impactful Mother Nature can be. Sometimes it's very forceful and crashes down on the coast, sometimes pulling me under with it. But sometimes the ocean is also a gentle source of peace as well for many people. Sometimes the sounds of crashing waves tucks us into a good night's rest. Or sometimes here in California, you can see the sunset over an expansive blue sea, and it just gives you a moment to, to catch your breath. And so I hope that this next session inspires you guys to, to feel that connection to the ocean. Um, because although the first session was about many uh, different species of African conservation that we support at WCN, uh, and which inspired by our human origins out of Africa about 200,000 years ago, in this session, we're going to rewind the clock a few billion years to our real origins of life in the sea. And so our bodies are just like the planet, about 70% water, and it's our, our original womb of life on this planet. And you would think that with such a gift of water on this planet, we would treat it with more respect than we often do these days. But this lineup of speakers, the next three speakers you'll hear from, are all teachers to remind us of this connection to the sea and to water around us. And so I want to introduce the first speaker um, who vi is visiting us from his home country in Cameroon, Dr. Aristide Kamla, who is a National Geographic explorer, a marine biologist, and the founder and director of the African Marine Mammal Conservation Organization, where they focus on African manatees. Go crazy. Thank you, Tony. Have fun, Aristide. Thank you. Oh, wow, it's such a pleasure for me to be here today, seeing these beautiful faces. You know, it's not so often that we see people who value conservation is like us. So that's why I want to like run and hug each, every one of you, but we'll do that after my presentation. So today I want to talk to you about a place and a species that are very important to me. Lake Osa, and they are very important, they're very important to me also because they're going through challenges that I've been trying to solve. And I hope today maybe you'll be able to help me do that. Lake Osa is a 4,000 hectares lake that inhabits a lot of species, and especially the African manatee. And it's important to me because this is where my career as a marine biologist started. It's also the, in this place that I observed the African manatee for the very first time. How many of you have heard about the African manatee? Oh, that's not bad. But how many of you have seen the African manatee in the wild? Really? Well, I feel like I need to invite you in Cameroon so that you, should, you can be able to see your first African manatee in the wild. But how many of you have, have seen the Florida manatee or heard of it? Oh, wow. Well, the African manatee is pretty much similar to the Florida manatee. And the only difference is that the, uh, the Florida manatee is a little bit larger. But do you know why the Florida manatee is larger than the African manatee? Do you want to know? OK, I'll tell you. So, <laughs> The African, the, the African manatee is, is a little bit slender because they live in this hardship area of Africa where they are constantly running away from poacher that try to kill them for their meat. Whereas the Florida manatee, they live in this beautiful country of the United States of America enjoying the hamburgers and the donuts. Well, no, this is not true. But the reality is that the Florida manatee are a little bit larger because they live in this area where the, 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 cold, the, the cold winter forces them 
to hibernate in this uh, warm water spring where they will stay there weeks without food. So they need this extra layer of fat, an extra layer of fat in order to, you know, as a reserve for energy, but also to insulate themselves from the cold. Whereas the African manatee, as you can see on this map, the African manatee, they live in a tropical area, you know, along the west coast of Africa, where it's always, winter, always uh, summer, so they don't have to, you know, to hibernate, or they don't need so much uh, uh, fat, you know, to insulate from the cold. And there are three species of manatees. The African manatee, as I show you, are around here, but you also have the West Indian manatee that include two subspecies, including the Florida manatee, that are in this pink area. And you have the Amazonian manatee that lives in the Amazon. Lake Osa is also a home for other species, like uh, marine mam uh, mammals, uh, reptiles, but also a lot of birds, like this pie kingfisher, and I'm gonna make the bird excited here. And then you have, you have the, the long tail of the long tail cormoran, and before that, I missed one, oops, the little egret, the yellow billed kite, the palm nut vulture, Oh, why is it going? Oh. oh, yeah. And then, the, and then also, there is also, oh, before, I don't know why it's, okay. And then also you have the African soft shell turtle. And within this, this Lake Osa is also, is, Mother Lake Osa is also so kind because she provides food for the many fishermen, about 300 fishermen that lives in the lake and the 17,000 local community that are around this lake. And, it's, and there are about 36 species of fish that are present there here. But unfortunately, unfortunately in this lake, the fishermen that are here, when I started my conservation work in Lake Osa in 2009, most of these fishermen was killing the manatee as a retaliation for the, their net that they claim manatee has destroyed. So, and there was a lot of restaurants selling a manatee meat. So we had to respond to that. And we, that's why in, 2000, in 2010, I founded the African, Mar the African Marine Mammal Conservation Organization, AMCO, and with my team, we have been implementing conservation actions such as raising awareness, but also uh, providing alternative livelihood to this community. And today, there is no restaurant providing manatee meat around Lake Osa. <laughs> so as we are about to celeb do celebrate this success, conservation success, another threat arrives. So what you see on the screen here is not a playing ground. It's actually an evasive plan called Salvinia Molesta that started spreading over this lake in 2017 and covered almost 50% of the lake's surface in 2021. So that, and you know, the African manatee, they leaves. oops. The African manatee, they live on the water, so they spend most of their time on the water, and the only surface when they want to breathe. And actually, the picture you just, you just see, you just, you just saw, is a manatee not in the natural habitat. It's in an aquarium. This is how you, will, you see the manatee when they are in their natural habitat, because the water is always murky, and the manatee is shy. But we have to use the opportunity as the surface to breathe in order to observe them. But how will manatee be able to breathe when this plant covering the surface of the lake is preventing them from surfacing? That's, uh, so the Salvinia has been a problem both for the African manatee but also for, for the people. This is how the lake used to look like when there was no manatee, uh, when there was no Salvinia. There was a lot of this plant. This plant is called Echinocora pyramidalis. It's the antelope grass, the, the favorite food of the African manatee in Lake Osa. But when, Sal when, Salvi when Salvinia came, it multiplied quickly and start choking down, uh, uh, started uh, choking down the Echinocora pyramidalis. It seems like my slide is changing by itself. I don't know what it is. Yeah, it's changing by itself, so. Okay, so the consequence of this is that there has been an, uh, the increase that we're observing of the 
the African manatee between 2015 and 2017, when we were implementing the conservation action, stopped and we start seeing a drop of the population in the Lake Osa, in Lake Osa because of the increase of Salvinia. And that has also impacted the, the, the fish population that you know, start collapsing, impacting the local community who doesn't have enough food for the, their family. So as in, in response to that, many of them started going into the forest around the Lake Osa, chopping down the trees, burning down for agricultural purposes, and which further even increased the amount of nutrient into the lake through runoff. And this nutrient increasing also increased more salvinia. So in response to that, in, together we, we mobilized the local community to organize what we call a manual removal, where we train the community on how to remove this plant and transform it into what we call uh, biologic, uh, ecological charcoal. But this method was not enough to address the problem because the Salvinia molesta uh, double in biomass every eight to 10 days. So we have to find another herb, this tiny insect called the Salvinia weaver that fits specifically on the Salvinia. So right after my, my PhD, right after my PhD defense in, at, the, at the University of Florida, I flew directly at the Louisiana State University to meet some experts in biological control. They trained me how to, uh, uh, to macerate those weevil, and two days later, I was taking a thousands of weevil to Cameroon in order to release them into the lake. It wasn't quite easy because it took about one year and a half to the government to accept this approach because it was the first time that this was being implemented. And the local community was also very skeptical about it because they think that the weevil will, will uh, bite them or even will destroy their plants, but none of that happened. But we finally received the authorization and we released the, the weevil. And this is how the lake used to look like before, before we... Uh, this is how the lake used to look like before we released uh, the, the weevil. So it was all green and fresh and, and fleshy, and uh, there were almost no manatee during this time. But six months later, this is how it started looking like. The weevil was killing the, 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 the salvinia, and it was browning. You can see how the browning is expanding. And in 2022, all the most of the lake was brown like this. This is how the lake looked like in 2020 before we introduced the weevil. And just a few days ago, I went back to the same site and I took this picture. Thank you. As a result of that, we start seeing more manatee coming back, but also more fish coming back also for the happiness of the local community. But as we were about to also celebrate this success, this success, we realized that it's too soon. Why? Because we addressed the symptom and the root cause of the problem was still unaddressed. And this was nutrient pollution. The lake is connected to a river, the largest river of the country. On, on this uh, river, there have been a lot of human activity at the industrial level, changing, uh, uh, changing the, degradating the landscape through the construction of dams, uh, reservoir dams like this. And while constructing this reservoir dam, they flooded 500 kilometers square of forest, equivalent to the size of the state of California. And by doing this, these plants will die and release their nutrient into the water, and which will then flow downstream and more, uh, contaminate the lake. And there's also other agricultural uh, practices that is even increasing the concentration of nutrient. So that's why with my team, we've been working along the Sanaga River and Lake Osa in order to uh, monitor the quality of the water in order to understand where is the, are those nutrients coming from mostly. And with the data, we've used that to, um, you know, to advocate for a policy reform through an event that we call the street Manatee, and to outside you will see in you know, our T-shirt of this uh, of this event, and where we gather uh, different stakeholders within this watershed to discuss about the issue related to this area. 
And when we gathered this, and as we gathered them, we, uh, we presented them the problem, but we also discussed about the solution. So now they know exactly what to do, but we need to know our own path. So that's why with your support, we will be able to restore the, uh, the forest around the lake. We are also going to monitor the African manatee and understand the impact of nutrient pollution on, the, on, on their health and also on their population. But we are also going to be able to provide more alternative livelihood to the local community and maybe even construct a manatee rehabilitation center, the first one in the entire continent, where we will be able to rehabilitate injured manatee and also orphan manatee. And when you will be, when, and this action will benefit all of us. Through this action, you'll be able to come to come to come to Cameroon, and I hope you will come soon and be able to see this animal in the wild for the very first time. And the local community will be so thrilled to welcome you, guide you through the, through the lake, and uh, host you, and maybe get some dollars from you. Because this is how they will understand what I've been telling them that a life manatee is worse than a death manatee. And finally, the African manatee will be forever grateful and will remember you. Thank you. It, you can give it to Louise. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Amazing. Thank you so much, Aristide, for sharing about the African manatee and your incredible work at AMCO. Um, next up, we have joining us from, we're going to go uh, off the coast of Africa, across the Western Indian Ocean, eventually to Malaysia, um, where the next organization, Maraset, works to support marine mammals in Malaysia. They were actually the first organization, uh, Malaysian-led, to focus on marine conservation in the country of, of marine mammals, of whales, dolphins, and also dugongs, which are a similar animal to manatees that you'll learn more about. Um, but I want to introduce Dr. Louisa Panampalam, who's the founder of Maraset, and she was one of the first uh, Malaysians to ever receive also the Pew Charitable Trust Award for Marine Conservation, an incredible peer in the partner network at WCN. So let's pass it off to Louisa. Welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. How many of you here have ever seen a live mermaid? or would like to see one. Yeah, so you're in for a treat today. Um, so Aristide was just talking about the African manatee, and today you get to witness a very rare footage of a mermaid. So did you know that dugongs gave rise to the myth of mermaids? In this video, you can see a mermaid, a, a, a dugong, sorry, living its best life, swimming above a seagrass meadow, all those dark patches underneath uh, a seagrass. So this is a cousin of the African manatee. Uh, it surfaces, takes a breath, and then it will dive down, and it can spend about three to four minutes feeding on seagrass, of which it needs about 40 to 50 kilograms of consumption a day. Dugongs are also known as sea cows, and they are one of the species that we study uh, and work to protect in Malaysia along with the Indo-Pacific humpback dolphins, also known as the pink dolphins. As you can see, they turn pink when they reach maturity. Indo-Pacific finless porpoises. Irrawaddy dolphins. Now, these dolphins are a little bit more peculiar. You can see that they lack a snout. They have a rounded head. As well as the majestic Brutus whales, otherwise also known as Eden's whales. Now, apart from the fact that all these species I just showed you um, share the similarity of being mammals that live underwater and breathe air, right? Making them marine mammals. What else? What, what is the similarity between all of them? The issue of bycatch, or rather accidental entanglement in fishing gear. Sorry, just going to make that video play. This is uh, an incident uh, last year where my team observed um, the accidental entanglement of an Indo-Pacific humpback dolphin. Now, luckily for this dolphin, uh, the fisherman detected it in his net uh, early enough that he could proceed to release it um, and um, set it free. And, um, but this is a problem that is prevalent all over the world 
with many whales, dolphins, porpoises, and even dugongs, uh, whereby they often get accidentally caught in fishing nets. So this was the lucky day of that dolphin. It managed to be set free. But a little bit unfortunate for the fisherman, who told us afterwards that his net was damaged. Now, why is bycatch, or accidental entanglement in fishing gear, a problem for these marine mammals? A lot of it is due to our insatiable appetite for seafood all over the world. In fact, just further south from here, in the upper Gulf of California, in Mexico, the vaquita, the world's smallest cetacean, uh, and also currently the world's most threatened species of marine mammal, uh, is threatened with extinction, with only about 10 individuals left in the wild. And what has caused its severe decline is due to bycatch in fishing gear. I wanted to show you this video as well, just to highlight, you know, we're talking about coexistence today. And this video shows you a, a pod of Indo-Pacific humpback dolphins in our field site, just slowly swimming. They're all traveling along together. But you can see here that they're actually swimming past a fishing net. The green flag that you see in the video that marks either the start or the end of a, of a fishing net, a gill net. So in Malaysia, we have nets marked uh, at the front and back of it with a flag. And you can also see in the background, there are smaller little flags. Basically, there were many nets in the water in this area. So these animals have to deal with swimming around in their ha habitat every day and learning how to dodge fishing nets. Imagine if you had to go through every day trying to get home or walking through your home and going through obstacle courses. That's pretty much how they have to live their lives every day. There are many, many nets in the, in the, in the sea these days um, to, to catch fish for us. Now, this group of dolphins were lucky that day that they were smart enough to avoid the nets and not be affected by it and swim along. But we know from uh, over the years of chatting with local fishermen and local fishing communities that bycatch does occur in their fishing nets. And so, about a year ago, we had the opportunity to embark on a new project called the Cetacean uh, Bycatch Mitigation Project. Okay, what you see before you here is a banana, the fruit, and a device we call the banana pinga. Can you tell which one is the fruit and which one is the device? Yeah, I think it's quite obvious. Um, so how does this banana pinger work? Banana pingers are a device that emit a high-frequency sound, which is inaudible to us, uh, inaudible to fishes, but audible to these marine mammals. And they are placed, uh, affixed on fishing nets uh, to do two things. One is to alert the dolphins or porpoises, that there is a net there, so please avoid. And at the same time, in avoiding it, it prevents these animals from getting entangled. At the same time, it also helps provide a win-win solution to the local fishermen, because then they don't have to get a, a dolphin stuck in their nets, and in the process of releasing it, whether dead or alive, they don't have to deal with their nets being damaged, which causes them uh, money and time to fix. So what we have done with this program in the past year, our team members have gone out, uh, we're focusing our efforts in a local state uh, called Berak first, because these are trials, uh, and they're being done in our country for the very first time, so it's very much trial and error. And our team goes out and talks to local fishermen and explaining to them about what these banana pingers are, what they can do. Uh, we're trying to understand how everybody is coping with bycatch, how much prevalence of bycatch there is in their fishing gear. We've run community workshops to promote the use of um, these devices. And of course, initially, the local fishermen were skeptical because they didn't think it would work. They were worried that it would affect their catch. Um, they also were worried that it might be a trick to sort of penalize them if they got um, animals accidentally caught in their nets. But after some time of talking to them repeatedly and showing them examples of how this has worked in other parts of the world, um, 
we've managed to have eight fishermen sign on with us over the last year, uh, whereby we've distributed about 47 banana pingers and getting them to record for us what they observe, whether there's been any difference in their fish catch, whether there's been any difference in um, the occurrence of bycatch. And as of a couple of months ago in February, we've managed to recruit eight more because it seems that these pingers are um, working positively for the fishermen, and by word of mouth, they are telling their peers, and more and more local fishermen want to try. Because initially, one, one fisherman was like, OK, I'll try. And his friend sitting next to him was like, let him try first. I'll see if it works, right? So we're very glad that uh, more and more fishermen are being recruited, and we expect in this coming year for more fishermen to join the program as word spreads that it is pretty useful. This is just to show you what it looks like being installed on the nets. Um, and they actually, these nets are really, really long, so they need quite a number of pingers. And we are currently working on acquiring more pingers so that we can distribute more to each fisherman. And the idea is that if it works, we want to scale it up to other fishing communities across the country. And if it doesn't work, then we want to find alternatives um, that would work. So what have we found so far? So far, we have found that the pingers appear to be effective on Indo-Pacific humpback dolphins. Uh, the fishermen are reporting that they don't get the dolphins approaching their nets anymore or stealing catch from their nets. They're not getting bycatch as much anymore. However, it does not seem to be effective for Indo-Pacific finless porpoises. Um, we're investigating why. Is it a matter of numbers? We need to put more on the net. Um, is it a matter of the device doesn't work for these porpoises who have ultrasonic um, hearing range? Um, or what is it? So we're going to spend the next months investigating this, but also continue trialing the existing banana pingers in different ways to see whether it works. On top of um, running workshops to try and tell the local fishermen about these banana pingers and, and what it does, we also run workshops to help transfer information to them on how best to handle disentanglement of a dolphin from their net. Um, and so we've done this workshop several times and they've been received very positively um, by the local fishermen and we hope to do more this year. So aside from the bycatch mitigation project that we do, at Marset, we also do a lot of intensive scientific research. This is just an example of an infographic that we've produced from our decade-long research in the northwestern uh, waters of Peninsular Malaysia. And the point here to be made is that we have managed to do intensive research that helps us, like in this example, uh, identify important and core nursery grounds and feeding grounds of these dolphins up in this area that then allows us to make recommendations to the government, the local government, our national government, decision makers, um, on what we need to consider to better manage and conserve these dolphin populations in that area or in uh, any area that we work. Other things that we do throughout the country is provide a lot of capacity building training um, for local communities. Yes, that's a dolphin that you see stranded on the beach. Yes, we were running a community marine mammal stranding response workshop. So we needed someone to volunteer to be a dolphin where we strapped on a fake dorsal fin on him and everybody, and he had to pretend to be stranded on the beach flapping around. So you can't see it in the photograph, but he's actually wearing snorkeling fins. So that's his tail. Um, and he had to act distressed um, on the shores. And then we get people to role play uh, what to do when there's a stranding of, a, of an animal, whether dead or alive. So we do a lot of this kind of capacity building training so that when an animal strands, the chances of its survival would be much higher uh, because people will know what to do. We also have an extensive marine education and outreach program. Um, what you see here is our whale truck, otherwise our program known as the Whales on the Wheels Mobile Marine Exhibition. 
um, which was actually inspired by the whale bus program of the Marine Mammal Center in Sao Salito. Um, and over the last, thank you, over the last two years, we managed to take this truck on a nationwide tour uh, across the entire peninsula Malaysia, reaching more than 20,000 visitors, children and adults alike. And we'll be doing more of it um, this year and targeting more local schools where we can bring the ocean to these schools. But in times when we are unable to bring the truck to the schools, we also run our Sea Science and Schools program, where we bring the ocean into the classroom of these kids. Now, you'd be surprised, many of these schools that we go to are actually in coastal communities. And even though many of these children were raised in and around the coastline, they don't actually know much about what's happening in their ocean backyard. So by running these programs, we try to give them a different infusion of knowledge from their typical everyday classroom learning in the hopes that they can be more aware of what's in their backyard and to encourage them to be future or present and future ocean guardians. Other projects that we have embarked on are sometimes to provide local community children um, with learning spaces. So some years ago, for example, we built this little pavilion uh, in fact, it was designed by uh, somebody from within this wonderful community of WCN supporters. And we built it over three weeks. Um, and we built it for these kids in the village, where they now use it for after-school extracurricular activities, learning about birds, frogs, nature, photography, culture, etc. Yeah. And all the work that we do, all the science that we do, all the outreach that we do, isn't just confined to the field, isn't just confined to the, to the general public. We also put a lot of the work, that our research findings, into policy advocacy. Um, we have assisted by providing recommendations of our research findings to decision makers, suggesting um, areas that need to be considered for protection and how we can better protect it. For example, um, this is me briefing a group of um, government agencies uh, whereby we are trying to establish speed limit zones in dolphin core habitat areas, in areas that we've identified as being important feeding and nursery grounds. So we're trying to come up with how to best establish speed limit zones and a good boating code of conduct. And we brief, from time to time we will organize just uh, meetings to present our work um, so that uh, government agencies are in the know of what's happening and if there's anything important that we need to propose, we will do it um, then. So for example, our work uh, on dugongs, just going back to the dugongs that you saw in the first place, our work on dugongs for the last 10 years has, has actually acted as a catalyst for our government to take interest in wanting to gazette a dugong sanctuary in our field site. And we've been guiding that process over the past year. Um, we've been in discussions with them, guiding the process on how big the sanctuary should be, what are the regulations that should go in, etc. And this is all based on all the research work and uh, public outreach work that we've done. And I'm also very happy that um, local fishermen, as part of our bycatch mitigation program, are uh, telling us that they can see the difference between uh, using pingers and not using pingers because their friends who are not using pingers are struggling with the use of, uh, with, without uh, using pingers. So it's all very encouraging that the, the program is uh, showing positive impact. And so before I leave, I just wanted to show you that this is my team back in Malaysia. Uh, we're a small team, we're doing all this work, and we're very grateful for all the support that we've received through the WCN community and, and partner network. And I leave you with this short little video. Um, when I was a little girl, I wanted to protect dolphins because this is how I imagined that their lives should be. They should always be living their best lives, swimming in the sea, wild and free. And the ocean sustains so much of life on Earth. Without a healthy ocean, uh, it would be quite difficult for us as human beings. And dolphins and other marine mammals are actually indicators of the health of the seas. So ensuring their survival actually means that we are trying to ensure our own future here on this planet. So I invite all of you to join me 
um, and Mars set in this mission to safeguard our marine mammals. Uh, come join us, come visit us in Malaysia, happy to show you around, and together we can make this mission of protecting um, the ocean sentinels um, uh, for a long time to come, so thank you. Thank you so much, Louisa and the Marasset team. Um, Louisa, last November, we actually both had the special privilege of going to travel together to this next last speaker for the Marine session. Um, if you guys are wondering, you're like, hey, Tommy, this is a beautiful Marine session, but we'd love to get underwater and see some clearer water than the, the foggy water of Malaysia or, or Cameroon. Well, now's your chance. We're gonna take a deep dive, so catch your breath. Um, but we're going to travel a bit further east from Malaysia to the Mesul Islands around Raja Ampat, Indonesia, where our next partner, um, a recent partner to WCN's network, the Mesul Foundation, uh, led by Virli Yurikin, where is working to protect one of the most biodiverse coral reefs in the entire world. And so we're really thrilled to be partnering with Mesul Foundation and for you guys to hear more from Virli and her team to support this work. Go ahead, Virli. Thank you, Tommy. Yeah, no problem. Have fun. All right. Hello, everyone. I'm very grateful to be here to see all of you. I'm going to give a, like, a little plot twist because Tommy already said that you're going to see like clear water and, and a very beautiful image underwater about where I work. This is me standing in front of the, on the top of the uh, open dumping landfill that is located in Sorong. Um, I started joining Missile Foundation six years ago as an intern to this uh, waste bank program. It's a community-based recycling program that focuses on uh, plastic pollution reduction in the coastal area in the waste Papua. And whoops. Okay, and today I'm here as the chairperson of the Missile Foundation. I'm here representing the work of my other uh, 49 team members uh, in the field. So I'm going to take you to a little journey to protecting the world features reef. Now, I would like to, you to imagine if you have something really precious, like your home, your house, or any other valuable asset that you have. You must be want to secure it, and you must be want to protect it, right? And in here, what I would like to talk about is, it is a home to 75% of world's known coral species, and over 1,600 species of fish. And sometimes I also like to describe it as a fish bank. Sometimes it's easier for the community to understand it. So Misal is the size of 1,220 square kilometer of no take zone area. It is located just south of the equator in Raja Ampat. And there is a thriving reef, a swooping manta rays, as you can see, and a bustling shark population in there. However, in the early 2000s, it is not actually looks like that, and these water were threatened by illegal fishing and dynamite fishing, and also shark finning like this. Back then, it was really rare to see sharks on the reefs. And around 2008, Missile Foundation, together with Missile Resort, uh, we initiated the Missile Marine, Protect, Ma Missile Marine Patrol to protecting the reefs. Uh, we're working with uh, 18 local rangers from the local community around it uh, for 24-7 protecting the area. Oh. And around uh, in 2023, we've done like 1,150 trips to work uh, around this MPA. We have three ranger stations uh, that meaning by, whoops, uh, uh, by our rangers. And with a powerful partnership uh, between the local communities and also the local government, Missile Resort and Missile Foundation, we have removed these threats. So now what? After we remove these threats, 
when we've already um, Okay. It's not only that the exploitation has stopped, we started to monitor the, the numbers of the fish biomass and also the biodiversity in there. The, diversity, the biodiversity and the biomass has increased. Uh, by, by the first decade after our operation, we have increased the fish biomass by 250% compared to before when we operate in there. Thank you. So our story shows how the coexistence between people and also nature can thrive together and also can recover the damage. And then, talking about fish bank, if we want to compare about our regular bank and then the fish bank, if, for example, we ran out of uh, balance or we are low in balance in our regular bank, it's very easy for us to just top up the balance, right? But how about the fish bank? Can we top up the fish in our fish bank? Of course not. So when, when the fish bank is destroyed or robbed, we cannot easily just top up the fish. So what would you do if you cannot top up the fish? When we already ensure that we already eliminate all the destructive fishing that happened around the area, we started to doing the reef restoration for the damaged reef. And I would like to introduce you to uh, one of the rangers. His name is Tega. He previously joining us as a ranger, but now he found his patient deeper in the restoring the reef. This is his message to every one of you. Oops, it's not moving. Perbedaannya besar sekali. Sebelumnya, waktu yang belum ada restorasi, kita saya pernah mencari ikan nelayan, tapi tidak seperti yang sudah ada restorasi. Sekarang ada restorasi, ikannya tambah banyak. Oke, okay, as Tega said, when we restoring the reef, the fish started to come back. Uh, we committed to restoring 1,000 meters square per year since 2021, and it is just inside of the protected area, and. Ever since, Tega and his team, he worked with the other three uh, full-time members of the reef restoration team. They started to enjoy the fruit of the labor. And not just them, the local homes, they also got the benefit of these thriving reefs. Because we're still recovering from the pandemic, the local homestays, they started slowly bring back uh, their gas, and then they chose the gas to the reef restoration area just nearby our ranger station. And the local guides, they began to realize that there are more fish in there compared than before. By the end of 2023, we were really excited and also surprised at the same time because for the first time in our operation, the member of the community, they started to come to us and then they asked, hey, can we learn from you to restoring the reef? So it is such a milestone for us, and knowing that some of the reefs in their backyard are also damaged, they now wanted to restore the reef nearby the village. It is obviously gonna be outside of the no-take zone or, in, or, or outside of the protected area, but it's closer to their watch. Okay. So for the pilot, of course we said, Yes, of course, we want to help you. And for the pilot, we committed to restore 500 meters square um, damaged reef nearby the community. And then we've been working with 24 uh, people from the local community, and then we already done the survey for the, for the, for the pilot site, and we already choose like one pilot site in the first quarter of this year. And this is the result. So, whoops, it's not moving, okay. And then, while we learn about the importance of the people power bringing the most impact to the reef, our outreach team, they introduced that to the youth about our reef restoration work. 
there were only three high schools available for 13 villages in the coastal side of Missile Islands. And not everyone, not every student from the high school will have the privilege to continue the higher education. And what would they do if they don't have that privilege to continue their education? Of course, they will become a fisherman. So we want to make sure that uh, when they graduate from high school, they have the right information, they have the, the right knowledge about what are their responsibility for their sea and then how to take care of their environment. We have reached out to over 350 students per year to ensure, uh, to ensure that they really understand about their role uh, to the environment. And with this environmental education program, they've been visiting the reef restoration area, so they got to see the work uh, from the first hand, and they can directly experience the difference between the damaged reef and the healthy ones. Okay. Menurut saya, terumbu karang itu penting. Kalau tidak ada terumbu karang, berarti tidak ada ikan. Yeah. Harapan saya ke depan bukan kita sendiri saja menikmati. Kita punya saudara-saudara yang lain, kita punya adik-adik, bahkan anak cucu kita. Mungkin waktu ini saya masih ada, bisa lusa saya sudah tidak ada, cucu saya bisa menikmati atau anak saya bisa menikmati. Yeah. So Tega simply says that no reef, no fish. And with this works, we have the high hopes and we're working for more support from the local government, local communities, and of course, from all of you to protect and to restore the reef. And we hope to have your support to make this impact happen. And because what we do to our ocean, we're doing that to ourselves. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Virli. I'm sure you guys are filled with questions for Aristide and Louisa and Virli. I am as well. Um, but the beauty of the expo is that you get a chance to connect directly with these brilliant marine conservationists at their booth during a break. So we're going to step into a break now. Um, but before we go, I just wanted to say uh, thank you to all these marine conservationists for their incredible work and to inspire us that, you know, we're partially water too. And just like water, I think we can flow and adapt to the different changes in our world that we're seeing and try to shape a new world that's better for all of us and for the marine life and wildlife terrestrially as well that we share it all with. So please come back in 20 minutes. We're going to take you on a journey to the Americas for the last session of the day. And we'll see you here around 3.45.
All right. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. How are we doing? How are we feeling? Yeah. It's been a pretty amazing morning. Um, so my name is Paul Thompson. I'm the head of conservation programs at WCN. And every day we're dealing with very hard stuff. And often it's tiring, it's exhausting, there's conflict, there's populations blinking out in front of us. But then we have Expo and everything is like, all right, yeah, there's good people out there. And we're gonna continue that this afternoon. So we started in Africa this morning, then we went to the marine realm, and now we're moving over to the Americas. And our first speaker is uh, from Peru and has been working there for about two decades on South America's only bear species, the spectacled bear. Now, when we first had spectacled bears on the expo stage, it was back in 2015, and co-founder Robin Appleton was showing these videos of these spectacled bears like clinging to the side of a cliff, and they're incredible, incredible animals. And so SBC, the Spectacle Bear Conservation Society, has been working to protect bears and their habitat. And they do that, as you've seen throughout the day, using this common theme of community engagement combined with good science and habitat protection. So to do that type of work, you need a really strong leader. And it's my great pleasure to introduce that person who has the skills to bring people together for Spectacle Bear Conservation. So please welcome to the Expo stage, Mr. Alex Moore. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Paul. Um, thanks, everyone. And it's a pleasure to be here. And yeah, my, my previous colleagues started asking how many of you uh, know their animal. So I don't want to be disappointed if I ask how many of you have seen a spectacle bear in the wild. Oh, yeah, I have three. Yeah, that's awesome. But instead, maybe I can ask how many of you uh, know that the story of the party number is related to Peru? Yeah, that's great. That makes me feel better. <laughs> well, as Paul has said, we are working to protect this big animal. Uh, the cup in the photo is Justina. Justina is one of the first cubs that we observed in the wild. And actually, the sheep is now uh, 14 years old. And yeah, all these years we're monitoring Justine and other bears in a population, in a unique population in northern Peru. And that has given very good information about what to do in terms of conservation. But for those, uh, OK. This was my first encounter with the spectacular bear, 15 meters away from where I was. And you know, <laughs> this animal was this size, it's longer than me, when I, I'm not as tall, but it's, uh, it's been very spectacular this moment for me, but also because seeing a, a black big animal, you know, 15 meters away was a bit scary. But what we started to understand is the Andean bear, because most of the range of this species is also in the Andes of South America. This is mostly uh, eating on vegetables. 90% of the diet of the spectacular bears are plants. And they are very playful, as you can see in this video, that they are sharing the food, eating the greens. But the story of the spectacular bear is also related to how the human population has expanded in all the South America. This map shows what it should be the distribution of the spectacular bear in Peru of 500 years ago. Now it looks like this. So approximately half, 50% uh, of the habitat of these species have disappeared because of the fragmentation, because of the expansion of the uh, populations in Peru. And by the way, Peru has the, uh, the largest population of the Andean bears in all of South America. So it's a big challenge when we have to think about how to protect the habitat of a big animal, like an Andean bear. So that's why we need to combine our strategies to protect uh, the, 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 all the habitat for this animal. So 
For example, in the map, you can see how we are working with a national protected area, which is in light green, with an indigenous community land, uh, and also with a piece of land that we want to purchase, which is a key feeding area for this animal. But when we are trying to protect the bears, what is only behind the bears? And 60% of the wildlife in all the Andes, in all the mountains in South America, share the habitat with the Andean bears, with the spectacular bears. Cats. Every year there are more records of new uh, species discovered for science, like these orchids in Machu Picchu. But the story of the bear is not, also related, not only related to wildlife, but also related to human culture, again, in all the Andes in, the Andes in South America. This pottery is from the Moche culture. They live in the same area in the dry forest where we are working now. And they may be considered like, a, like as a god. Like now, there is a big celebration. The largest peregrination that we have now is in the area around Cusco is related to the bears. As you can see, this man is dressed like a bear. And thousands of people dressed like bears and the Quechua name for the bear, by the way, is the Ukuku. They walk to the glaciers every year to thanks to the Apus, to the mountain god. But the mountains is, is a, a very difficult ecosystem, probably for an animal. Which, in our case, we are focused to, start, to study and protect the bears in a dry forest ecosystem in northern Peru. And maybe you've seen this video before, but can you imagine a big animal with a black fur, maybe black as I am dressed, but walking in, a, in some days when the weather can be around 100 Fahrenheit degrees. So that is the kind of adaptation that this population has. Even the food is not available all the year because it's very seasonal. So these bears have to be adapted to feed on even the trunks of the trees. And the water is the other thing that is very scarce in the ecosystem. So there are just few waterfalls after the rainy season that remains during the year. And that is where these animals and all the wildlife have to you know, provide water. This is how usually the landscape uh, of the habitat of the very northern Peru looks like. But after the small rainy season that we have, some of them related to the Nino rains, it can turn into like this green landscape. And for sure, when there is more green, when there's more life, bears like Justina, again, here is Justina, can be very healthy. They, lose, they have more resources to feed on, but this is just a small period of time during the years and even during the one year because the rainy season in our country is just three months, probably from December to February, from January to March. And the rest of the years is very dry as the landscape that I show you. So what happened in those months, what happened in those years that we have a severe drought? So bears are adapted and they lost weight. And it is very hard for them because uh, it is how they affect the survival of the females, how they are affecting the survival of the calves. And as I told you, Justina is 14 years old now. She had uh, five liters. And from the five liters she had, only one bear has survived. But it's, it's not only for bears, which is difficult to, to live in an ecosystem like this, even for people. So for many years, and as the climate is warming every year, so the conditions for the people in an area where we are working is also very hard. And also for our staff. You know, our staff have to spend many hours in the field trying to spot a bear, trying to collect all the information. Yeah, and there is no shades <laughs> um, in the area. So, but all these conditions, and every year, probably, again, as the climate is changing, is very challenging. So. This photo is a, a forest fire that we had in February this year, close to the area that we are working. And it's a, a sample how this, you know, year by year we are losing 
uh, surface of bear habitat because this this uh, bear population is needs not only the mountains, they also needs the the flat areas to feed on the specific that tree that is in the that is surviving. This is a sapote tree that gives a fruit that provides you know the calories for the females to to get fat. So, but again, back to the water hose, which is you know they remain just small. Um, holes of water during most of the year, and they are visited by years. This is the only source of water for the bears, for wildlife. This is how they interact in this. They need this water host to re thermoregulate when they, all the, the females and males usually um, meet each other. But rather, uh, shortly after this, uh, this video, we got this. Yeah. So there is also domestic animals, uh, cattle, dogs, some of them are feral dogs probably, visiting the same area. So that is several uh, many um, threats that we are facing now. But yeah, with all the support that we are having from you, we are starting changing the scenario for the bears in the dry forest. So we have been purchasing land. With start, we started the restoration programs with the key uh, to provide water to make the, the plants that are part of the bear food available, but also by building water holes. You know, if the water is a limited uh, source in the, we need to pro to build water water holes. So, and this photo makes a milestone for us. This is an artificial water hole that we built a year and a half ago. And this photo was taken in February this year. And this is the first visit that Justina is visiting the water hole. That's a good sign for us. We're very you know, happy to see this. But we need to purchase more land. We need to protect more land. As I told you before, we are now to protect a big piece of land in the middle of a landscape. So we need to raise $1.5 million to purchase and protect 5,000 acres of key habitat for this population of bears. This is our main, one of the main goals that we have now. But it's not only working with the bear habitat. We also need to work with communities around these areas. So that's why we, need, we have this FELTI program. We are working with around 100 ladies of the rural areas close to the bear habitat producing these felty products that you can purchase, by the way, on the booth. We also, and one of, this is very interesting that a third of all the ladies that are working with us in this program are single parents. So the income that they are providing for the families is key also for, you know, for the family economy. Yeah, and this is this animal that we are selling in markets here in, in uh, North America. And we see potential and through this program just to engage more communities, to engage women, to provide you know, a source of living for the populations in the bear habitat. And as I told you, if we have dogs visiting the water holes in the, in the forest, we also need to work with pets. And the relationship with the community with the pets and even the children with the pets in the rural areas is not as, as many of you have in the cities. You know, some of the animals have disease, uh, they don't have um, vaccination. So that's why we are providing our services to improve the health of these animals. You know, <laughs> and to also to, it's, it's a way also to engage new generations in the new thinking how to care animals um, and wildlife. <laughs> yeah, they are very happy every time we are going to, to provide vaccines to the animals, they are the first one to, to give us the, the dogs. But it's not only the work that we are doing in northern Peru, with all the experience that we had for 15 years, now we have, we've moved to the, the southern Peru in one an iconic area. I'm not sure you can see, but this is the Machu Picchu ruins. And as you can see, it's surrounded by an incredible forest. So this is area is spectacular. It combines nature, culture, and it's also, um, this is a key bear habitat. 
And this is a place where the bears probably has been, you know, coexistent with people, with the Incas for many centuries. But now that coexistence is changing. Because again, Machu Picchu is probably the, um, the area where most of the tourists are going when they are going to Peru. More than a million people is visiting Machu Picchu every year, and that is creating also an impact. And also for local people who is living in the area, you know, before the creation of the national park in Machu Picchu, that is also affecting the bear habitat and all the wildlife that, uh, that is in the park. But the Peruvian government has also a, a big project that we are supporting. That is Machu Picchu. It's very close to the uh, lowland Amazon. This is another big national park. This is the Manu, probably one of the largest national parks that we have in Peru. The project that we have now is to create a biosphere reserve, sorry, to create a biosphere reserve that can join both parks. And most of that initiative is related to bears. Actually, when the Peruvian government started to think how to protect big piece of habitat, big piece of land for, you know, for, for the wildlife, it's also because they, the bears was one of the key species why they created Machu Picchu. Not only the ruins and all the Inca, but because of the bears. So last year we started uh, a big program, the largest program, uh, putting camp traps in the Machu Picchu area. So we know now that uh, there are around uh, 29 bears, big bears in the Machu Picchu, but this is just the beginning of our program there because we want to understand how bears are moving in this area. How are they using this la landscape? And as you can see, it's very hard to walk, to, to walk or to understand how they are moving in this part that is uh, around 40,000 um, hectares of area and how they're also using the surrounding areas far from the limits of the protected areas. So that's why we are now with the goal to put collars bears. We want to put satellite collars to, and we start baiting bears. <laughs> this is just a week, um, yeah, this is a week ago. And this is also a good sign for us because as I told you at the beginning, these bears are mostly vegetarians. But how to catch an animal, you know, just by putting, because we don't know what kind of uh, feed, um, vegetable is the best one in Machu Picchu. So we try with meat. And it's good because they are visiting the trap too. So we are very, very excited the moment that it's coming for probably in the next weeks or months, we are going to catch birds and put colors. And yeah, before coming here to the expo, we were in San, Fran in San Diego. With, uh, to pick up the three first colors that we have. And <laughs> but we need more. Actually, we need to understand more because this is a, a big, uh, larger area than it we have in, in northern Peru. So, again, if we want to protect the bear, if we want to protect an animal, this is like an umbrella to protect different other wildlife in Peru and South America, we need land, we need big pieces of land, we need to purchase this, this piece of land and make the coexistence with the local communities, you know, to happen more often. Thank you so much. Well done. Yeah. I'll take that. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, what an incredible program. I think we all need to go down there and have some beef in a hot tub with a, the bears down there. Um, and definitely check out the Felties, which are for sale outside, and they're going to help the program. Um, now we head over to Ecuador. Um, many people here are probably familiar with one of Ecuador's most, most famous biodiversity hotspots, the Galapagos. But over on the mainland, we have another biodiversity hotspot that's home to one of the world's most uh, endangered primates, the brown-headed spider monkey. And so our next speakers are gonna be telling us about this strange and unusual primate and what they're doing to conserve it. Now, one of the things about WCN that you might know is we have a knack for finding emerging startup conservation groups that are really effective, strategic, and hungry to do good work. 
basically wildlife entrepreneurs. And I think our next two speakers exhibit that. Uh, Proyecto Washu is one of the newest members of our partner network. And today I'm really excited to introduce Felipe Alfonso Cortez and Natalia Fuentes. Welcome to the stage. So hi everyone. Are you listening to me? Yeah, okay. So hi everyone, we are very excited to be here at the Spring Expo and to be the first time as partners of this wonderful family of WCN. So we are part of Proyecto Washu, an Ecuadorian conservation organization. What is happening? Okay. Okay. <laughs> so we are Proyecto Washu and we are part of an incredible team of passionate conservationists and primatologists. Without them, this, all this conservation effort and work could not have been possible. So through this presentation, we want to invite you all on a journey about this incredible and beautiful species, the brown-headed spider monkey. So allow me to introduce Binyamu. Binyamu is an adult male spider monkey with an average weight of around 8 to 10 kilograms. He is one of the biggest primate species in the Neotropics. Binyamu is primarily frugivorous, which means that his diet is mainly composed more than 70% of fruits. And this is very important because uh, from this characteristic of being frugivorous, other important features are developed. A spider monkeys are also known because of their agility. They have these long arms and they have a really long and strong tail. And with that, they can move very quickly uh, through the canopies for several, hundred, uh, for several kilometers per day. Binyamo's group uh, is composed of around 30 individuals. And they can uh, use big home ranges of at least 500 acres in good forest conditions which makes them an umbrella species too, because if we protect their territories, we will be protecting other species living in the same area. Also, Binyamu and his family are highly intelligent. Spider monkeys has uh, mental maps of their forest, and this is because they have to remember the paths to find fruit in trees all over the year. And as fruits are not a common and constant resource in the forest, they have developed interesting social behaviors and, uh, and, strat and ecological strategies to reduce the stress and competence within their societies. One of these strategies is called fission fusion, which means that when fruit resources in the forest are scarce, uh, the group can be separated into smaller subgroups, or even they can decide to be alone for hours, days, or even weeks. And when fruit production starts to increase again, uh, they find each other with the special callings, and the group can be together again. This unique feature that we were telling uh, about the fission fusion have only uh, registered for a few primate species in the world. One of these is the chimpanzees in Africa. A spider monkeys also shares with the chimpanzees other ecological similarities. That is why we like to make an analogy mm -hmm. that the spider monkeys is just like the, uh, just like the chimpanzees of the Americas. Mm -hmm. Only that the spider monkeys doesn't have this high profile as the chimpanzees, but we need to continue raising awareness about this amazing species too. When Vinyamu's group and family are separated for hours, days, or weeks. When they find each other again, they start their encounters just like you are seeing now, with a big hug. And this is very similar to us because when we are seeing our beloved ones after seeing them in a while, we want to do the same thing, to hug them and to feel embraced with our care. <laughs> now, being frugivorous, also gives spider monkeys their unique role in the ecosystem. As they feed with fruits of different seed sizes, they carry these seeds in their stomachs, and with their long arms and, tail, and tails, 
they can move uh, long distances through the forest very fast. And while they are doing that, they are digesting the seeds and then they disperse them all over the forest. So this is helping multiple plant and tree species. Spider monkeys, for this reason, are forest farmers, and they are really essential to the natural regeneration of their habitat. And they are best, the best seed dispersers. This video, these are the feces samples of one spider monkey in one day. The total seed count from these samples was 320 seeds. So you realize that here we have dozens of future trees, and this is, will be the future restoration of their habitat. Sadly, brown-headed spider monkey is currently one of the 25 most endangered primates in the world, and their habitat, the Ecuadorian Chocó, is one of the hotspots of biodiversity worldwide. In Ecuador, this habitat has lost more than 80% of its original forest coverage. And spider monkeys were historically distributed in this area that I'm highlighting now. Uh, but now, the situation is very bad because they have lost all this uh, huge amount of habitat and they only have this to live. Now, this uh, red square that I'm highlighting now is part of a province in Ecuador that is, the name is Manabi. At first sight, you can see that over there it seems to not be no forest left, and the spider monkeys were considered to be extinct for more than 50 years ago in this area of Ecuador. During these decades, the forest, these forests were destroyed to be transformed into pasture lands, and the spider monkeys were trapped in small fragments where they are doing the best to survive. In 2015, the species was rediscovered in this area, and since 2016, we have been working in this area, and we know that over there, there is around a population of 300 individuals, and we have registered in 22 forest fragments. The complicated situation over here is that all these fragments that are, highlight, that are uh, these uh, yellow plots, they are not connected anymore, so we need to work on the, connect, on the connectivity, and jo we are just seeing uh, the most endangered population of the species. In this forest, a spider monkeys uh, got trapped in fragments with hundreds of other species who continue to try and do whatever is possible to survive. In a world that does not seem to have a space for them, day after day, in search of food, crossing between roads and forests, they survive deforestation and hunting. And they only have their voice to be heard. But collectively, we know that we can all help to save them. And we, we need to do something over here in this place. So our plan begins in the green plots that are highlighted over there in the left. So we started in two years ago the creation of a protected area of 497 acres with these wonderful partners. Our short-term goal now is to continue increasing this area of the reserve, and this year, thanks to the IUCN Netherlands Land Purchase Fund, we will start protecting one of the biggest forest fragments in the area. And we would like to more people to be part of this strategy because our long-term goal in this area is to combine different conservation measures like purchasing other available lands, create conservation agreements with local communities and landowners, and to, of course, work in the connectivity and create bio-corridors through with and working with our uh, best seed dispersers, the uh, spider monkeys. With this, Viñamu, Viñamu's group, will have a better and resilient future. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. As you can see, habitat loss and fragmentation continue um, reducing wildlife populations, but at the same time, um, captive populations are increased. And this is why we want to share with you the importance of the work of rehabilitation and rescue because um, we want to share 
or worlds for a second life chance for the biggest captive population of brown headed spider monkeys in Ecuador. And probably you have a question that is, how are baby spider monkeys sourced from wildlife populations? And it seems like the mother would just let her baby be taken. And yes, like as uh, the mothers uh, will protect their babies with their lives. And this means that the only way for wildlife traffickers uh, to obtain a baby is kill its mother first. And yes, it's sadly, but just um, la, the other question is, what happened with this, these babies? And sadly, they, they will spend the rest of their lives caged or chained, and only or oh, less than 1% have the opportunity to return to freedom. And that is why for, we want to give them a new opportunity. And we decided in 2014 to start one program for the rehabilitation of this species. <laughs> sí. And we have been uh, had cases of hope such as Nara. Her name means beautiful, but when she was uh, found and rescued, she was living in, in a city, in a house, in this small cage where she has no space to move. And because of this and bad nutrition, she has uh, problem bones, and we need to feed her like you can see in the video, like a baby. And thanks or care and, go, and rehabilitation, we have the opportunity to, to, to give her um, uh, the, best, the best care, and she has the opportunity to regain her mobility. As you can see here, <laughs> Nara is, is better, and yeah. We, we, we know that this is a hard work um, because it, it is. Um, but we feel really fortunate because we have the opportunity to do something for, for them and change the, the lives of these monkeys. And currently we have 20 spider monkeys uh, in our care. And the center where they are now uh, manage naturalized enclosures with a small light length like um, with, with, tree, with trees and which contribute to the rehabilitation for these monkeys, for the behavioral, uh, behavioral rehabilitation for these spider monkeys. But, however, it is located between a large scale of farming and livestock activities and also this site want to become a soup. And that is why since our work began, we start looking for a new land to, buy, to build um, a specialized center for these primates. And unfortunately, we, we have the opportunity together with other partners to acquire a land of 80 acres where we fears the, the we fear we be where we start to build the first facilities and fortunately while we were working in the new land eh, con environmental conditions and farming farming in the current site has an impact in the health of, of the spider monkeys eh, in the center and we have take, um, we, we need to face some medical emergencies where we sadly lost our, uh, some of our monkeys. And for me, it's really hard to, to finish this presentation because we lost our monkeys and that is why Felipe is going to finish. So over there in the current site that these spider monkeys are, 
the risk related to the cross-contamination from the big scale agricultural business, human settlements, and bad water quality is what we are thinking that are affecting the health of the spider monkeys. So for these reasons, we really urgently need to move to the new site that we are trying to create. For example, over here, you can see this is happening all days in this center, sadly, because over there, uh, banana crops are a huge business and they need to be fertilized by airplanes, so we, this is very complicated. But beyond the importance of the spider monkeys, over the past 10 years, they have become part of our family. And just like any of us, we don't give up our families, even more in times of need. So we take our strength from them, and we always are looking for hope. And the creation of this new sanctuary is a reason for that. The, the enclosures on... Whoa, sorry. Okay. Oh, no. Nope. <laughs> yeah. The enclosures of the new sanctuary will be built based on the ecological, social, and behavioral needs of the species. With this, we will give them, again, the best care for a second life chance and for the ones who have been victims of the illegal trade, but also for the primates and for the spider monkeys that cannot be released and that who will be in human care for the rest of their lives, but with the best welfare conditions. This sanctuary will be the place for hope and to have a chance to be wild again. A future for them is a future for all. So thank you for thank you. being I'm here sorry. and thank you for it. Yes. <laughs> yes. Gracias, perdona. <laughs> all right, thank you so much. Proyecto Washu. Uh, we don't give up on our families. I really like that. It's a very cute little monkey. We have one more session today. And so to close out Expo today, we're going closer to home, right here in our own backyard. Um, what does conservation in California look like in 2024 and beyond? It's perhaps not what you think. If we are trying to protect pumas, wolves, tule elk, we might have to look at things like housing and highways. Well, our next speaker has been working at this intersection of policy, landscape protection, wildlife crossings, and biology for a number of years. I'm really excited to hear how he's been able to pull different groups together, and he exemplifies that type of convening power and leadership that's critical to getting things done in California today and beyond. So without further ado, Mr. Neil Sharma, welcome to the Expo stage. All right, thank you, Paul, and thank you all for being here. Welcome to the last session of the day. As Paul mentioned, my name is Neil Sharma. I lead WCN's California Wildlife Program, which is focused on conserving connectivity throughout California. In order to conserve connectivity, we're employing a variety of different approaches to protect and restore the conditions in the landscape that allow individual animals to find the resources they need to live their lives, that allow wildlife populations to remain viable and healthy, and that allow ecological relationships and processes to take place. These are all reasons why connectivity is crucial and why it's our focus here in California, especially given the, the nature and scale of habitat fragmentation that we're seeing here. As one of the major thematic areas of this work, we spent a lot of time assessing the negative impacts of highways and understanding how to address these, often through wildlife crossing infrastructure. So these measures that can reduce wildlife vehicle collisions, promote connectivity and safe passage for wildlife. And that's what we're really gonna dig into today. And I'm thrilled to introduce a brand new wildlife crossing project in an area of statewide importance. We're just getting this off the ground, so this this early days, but I thought what better time than Spring Expo to just give an early look to you all at this exciting new initiative. To set the stage, I want to start by asking how many people here remember the Wolf OR93? This is a wolf that was making the news a few years ago. Good, good show of hands, all right. So 
OR93 was a wolf that started out in Oregon and made this tremendous voyage, hundreds of miles south. I can't imagine what this wolf saw, the sights, the challenges. We know some of the challenges in that this wolf crossed multiple highways on this amazing voyage, hundreds of miles south. Made all that way close to Southern California and then was found dead right off a section of I-5 uh, near Southern California in the Tachapes near the town of Lebec uh, with the signs pointing to a, a vehicle strike as the cause. Now the story of OR-93 is, as far as we can tell, quite an outlier. It's not indicative of broader patterns we're seeing with wolf dispersal in California necessarily. I think any way I look at it, it's just an, an amazing story. But one of the things that's interesting is that the wolf made it all this way and then was killed on this section of I-5, which has been known to conservation as an area that needs to be addressed. It's within a broader landscape that's known as an important area for conservation. And lately, there's a lot of urgency that's changing the way we look at this landscape that's really related to this animal right here, the puma, or mountain lion, cougar, same species. And what we're seeing with many of the populations in California, especially coast, central coastal and southern California, is essentially isolated populations where they're not able to exchange genes, interbreed with their neighbors. We're starting to see the signs of inbreeding, which we know doesn't bode well for the viability of these important apex predators in their ecosystems. So this is a graphic that was derived from some recent demographic research on Puma populations here in California. The different colors correspond to potential subpopulations. And this is the landscape uh, right where that section of I-5 was. And, and we're going to take a closer look here in just a moment. One of the ways I think of this landscape is that it's essentially a linchpin of genetic connectivity. And what we really need to do is restore flow through this landscape, because this is the region where those imperiled coastal populations are connected to the abundant genetically diverse cats in the Sierra Nevada and beyond. So a really important landscape for that species. Throughout California, we have an extensive uh, system of, of built infrastructure, linear infrastructure, especially the highway system. The graphic behind me is a, a capture from an interactive wildlife crossing inventory that was produced by our partners at the Wildlands Network. It was produced with uh, grant support from WCN. The green icons represent completed wildlife crossings. Yellow are in construction, and the red are in planning. And as this resource was being developed, one of the things we noticed is there didn't seem to be anything in place or even underway in this section of I-5. This is a view of that landscape. I'm going to refer to it short, shorthand as the Tehachapis. The Tehachapi Mountains are in here. It's part of the transverse ranges, so essentially a east-west mountain range, if you want to think of it that way. It's a range that connects the Sierra Nevada to the coast. It's been referred to as a crucible of evolution because it's situated at the confluence of four distinct ecoregions. Really fascinating area, important for biodiversity conservation overall and we know there's a lot of urgency around connectivity in the area. Fortunately, this region is buttressed by some substantial protected areas, both existing now and planned in the future. It's a landscape that has a need for additional land protection, but we're, what we're gonna focus on today is really the highways, particularly Highway 58 and I-5. So 58 we have to the northeast, and then I-5 is that longer segment to the southwest. Highway 58 is, is, is a bit more promising, at least as, as of right now, because there's a great working group that's already in, in action, working on the highway right there. That's that straight shot sort of in the foreground. We're looking west into the Tehachapis. And by working group, what this really is, is a, a group of colleagues from agencies and NGOs who have gotten together, and we meet once, once a month or more to figure out what the issues are and how we can proceed with the interventions that are needed. So right now the focus is really on understanding the existing infrastructure, like this one that was built to drain water under the highway, but as you can see uh, with uh, our colleague there for scale as well as the 18-wheeler going over top, this is a large structure and it's used by multiple species in the area. So we're identifying these, figuring out how they're being used and figuring out how they can be enhanced to double as uh, more attractive and functional wildlife crossing features. And the group is also planning 
the, the design for two new dedicated wildlife crossing structures in this section of Highway 58. But we have to get back to the story of I-5. So that one started really jumping out on the radar <clears throat> when we were developing the wildlife crossing inventory. And so last year I reached out to a handful of colleagues, including some of our close colleagues at the Nature Conservancy and a group called SC Wildlands, a few others, and asked around, is anybody working on wildlife crossings on this section of I-5? And there was a resounding consensus that this is a, an important priority area to be addressed. It's been identified in multiple assessments, but there was no, no effort with any cohesion or momentum underway. It's just an idea. So late last year, we convened a meeting with some of the key stakeholders. The, the logos uh, behind me represent the, the organizations that, where we had representatives who came to this initial meeting of what's now an I-5 working group that's focusing on wildlife crossings on a 45-mile section of I-5. So this is a tall order. It's a big scope of work, but it's an area of intense need. And the group's now rolling forward with the nuts and bolts. So I, I, was, uh, I was out there a couple weeks ago when I took this image. I'm standing in the middle of I-5 in a large vegetated median between the southbound and northbound lanes, looking south here in the photo. This is in the northern part of the study area. But in, in a somewhat similar flavor to the work at Highway 58 and many other places where we're involved throughout California. We're down there by the side of the road, vehicles whizzing by, looking at the existing infrastructure, figuring out how it's being used, figuring out how it fits into a system of wildlife passage features that we're just starting to envision. We're also looking at areas where new structures are needed, where there's really nothing that's suitable that could be retrofitted or, or modified through some more modest enhancements. With a 45-mile section of highway, the assumption is we're going to need multiple new structures to be implemented here. So what we're working on is an action plan for a whole system of crossing structures. And we'll advance some of those all the way to uh, the shovel-ready design and, and then construction. But these are early days. This is an initiative we're just getting off the ground now. So we were out there a couple weeks ago in a drainage along the side of the highway. And I looked down and saw this gorgeous tree frog just right there by the side of I-5. And then we got a little ways away from the road and found fresh puma tracks, fresh black bear tracks, deer tracks. This is an area that's full of life, and these highways need attention to stitch the big picture of conservation together. One of the things that occurs to me is that we're really at the start of easily a decade-plus process. And I'm looking here uh, at the Laurel Curve Wildlife Crossing on Highway 17 in Santa Cruz County, so really nearby. Recently completed, that was a 10-year effort, essentially, from start to finish. And we could meditate on whether that's too long, whether that makes sense given the, the scale and the complexity of these kinds of efforts. To me, the, the important thing is that we're starting now. There's great momentum, and we're able to learn a lot from successful projects, including the challenges that people have overcome nearby and further afield with other wildlife crossing projects. This is an era of implementation for these kinds of features, and it's really exciting to be in it after thinking about these things for years. Another beautiful thing is that we know that when these features are in place, they will perform. So this is the first Puma using the crossing at Laurel Curve under Highway 17. Great work by the Land Trust of Santa Cruz County and many other organizations involved. We were able to help out in a minor way recently with the effectiveness monitoring. Uh, but it's great to see that these things work. It's just a heavy lift to get them from soup to nuts. One of the things we think about a lot through WCN's California Wildlife Program is how to advance efforts in parallel. Each of these projects is an immense lift be a decade at a time involving many organizations, public-private partnerships. And we're in a situation where we're not bound by geographic working areas, jurisdictions, or anything like that. So we can tailor our role to help establish or support different partnerships and figure out how to advance a cohort of crossing projects in parallel. So there's so much to be done here. We spend a lot of time thinking about how we can get things moving at the same time. Another piece, uh, in addition to the parallel efforts, is thinking about complementarity. So we've had this example of Laurel Curve at Highway 17, or the work at I-5 or Highway 58. These are essential place-based, on-the-ground interventions that need to be put in place. 
We're also working, and often with different partners, on policy solutions, often at a statewide scale. So while we're working with, with partners to remediate some of these on-the-ground issues, existing problems, we also need to be working on the systemic changes that are best addressed through policy. So working in parallel to advance pro progress and using complementary approaches are really what WCN's California Wildlife Program strategy looks like in action. So we can return to the topic of wolves in California, and at the time, OR93 seemed like an outlier. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. It's an amazing story either way. And then there was last year when we learned that there was a new wolf pack found in Tulare County, not too far from Bakersfield. And if we think about where that wolf pack showed up, or better, was found, and then we think about the Tehachapi's, Highway 58, I-5, those crossings that were in the early stages of planning and building right now, that's not very far in wolf miles. So it's not inconceivable that at some point in the future, the, the structures that we're, we're putting in place now might need to be used by wolves. What we do know is there's an urgent need here and now to restore gene flow and connectivity through that landscape and throughout much of California for these imperiled puma populations. We know that these kinds of structures will benefit many species in the areas where they're put in place. And we know that they're a really essential tool in the toolkit to put into the landscape as a long-term way to support biodiversity overall and functional, resilient ecosystems. I'd like to invite you to come find me at the California Wildlife Program booth out there with the other conservationists. I'm always happy to talk shop and would be uh, happy to con continue the conversation there. Thank you all for being here. All right, thank you, Neil. I think Neil's session was indicative of a theme that we've heard throughout the sessions today, which is that of collaboration, right? So at WCN, we aspire to create collaborations because that's the only way we're gonna enable the conditions for human wildlife coexistence going forward. So I'd like a big round of applause for all the speakers flying in from all over the world. They all work so hard to get here and to put together these talks. And one of the things that I love about Expo is it's an opportunity for you guys to meet and discuss and support them. So as a reminder, WCN has this 100% model where any donation you make to one of the speakers you heard today, we will make sure that 100% of your donation is gonna go to that speaker. So please be generous and help. I also wanna give a big shout out to the WCN team. Thank you so much for putting this on today. We do this entire expo in-house with a very small team, and so all of us are looking maybe a little tired, a little sagging, but you know, we, we really love doing it. Um, also want to thank the Wilson Sonsini Foundation for sponsoring the event. It's been incredible, and our uh, AV Partners Legion. Now, not all of our partners could be here today. We have a large and growing partner network, um, but the good news is they are coming back. So we do have one video message from one of our partners that we'd like to play for you. Hello, friends of WCN family. I am Poppy Wororoglu. I am here in Patagonia, in Argentina, my home country. And I am so sorry I cannot join you this a weekend in this for this expo but i will be with you in the next expo in october and i won't i'm not able to be with you now because we are tracking penguins doing their migration trip from southern argentina all the way to argentina uruguay and brazil and so looking forward to see you all in next october So please mark your calendars for our October Expo, which is October 5th in San Francisco. Thanks again for coming and have a great night.